Hello, uh, my name is Dan Hennon. Today is June 22nd, 2019. And for this conference call, uh, we are joined with Greg Fernandez, Jr., uh, Catherine, uh, and Sophia. And so it's the four of us here tonight. It'll be opened up, uh, the, 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 uh, basically the call line or the chat line will be opened up for other callers to come in and ask questions and also uh, use the chat room uh, to ask various questions as well. Uh, we're going to be basically providing, I think, just updates and just a discussion tonight uh, to get everyone up to speed. Uh, we had the final results of the private investigator come out recently, and uh, we ha we did a show on that. And now it's uh, hopefully asked to, uh, to answer a bunch of questions from that show. But now it's, tonight we're opening it up as a conference call to all those on the uh, justice page here, the members, to anything that we missed, anything that we could have gone into. Uh, I'm in the process of putting together my questions for, for Kenneth Maine uh, in response of what he wrote. So anything that would be helpful for that would be great. But uh, I think we're ready to go. How is everyone doing tonight? Awesome. Yeah, doing good. Doing fine. Well, perfect. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so where should we... Uh, Greg, do you want to, um, uh, or, or Catherine, or even Sophia, start off with anything that you've got um, that relates to updates, questions, and yeah, things was, that have come up uh, since then? Greg, do you want to yeah, start off? Yeah, I was thinking since we haven't had Catherine uh, really give her, her side, Catherine, if you want to kind of um, let us know what your thoughts are now that you've read the 25 pages and... Oh, God bless you, um, Greg. You're you're so cute because you just you remind me of my son. Um, I, I'm so glad you think I actually read it. Um, I have. In fact, I was, I was gonna Did you start ask, to read it? Did you read page one, page two? How far I did you get? I started with page one, but I got so angry at this. Um, uh -oh. Yeah, I had to end up taking a nitroglycerin, and I had to put it down. Um, <laughs> I well, and I skimmed through um, a lot. Well, not a lot, but several of. Um, he was doing bullet points of not only the inconsistencies I had written down, but comments others had made that didn't make sense to them. And his comments of, well, it could have been the dog. Well, I don't see it that way. And I'm like, but you said nothing else. He did not, you know, expand on his thoughts and. I kind of wanted to reach through the screen and shake him a little bit. Um, so I was going to ask you guys, what did he say? And I will go and read it eventually. I, I will, but right now he just, you know, still makes me pretty angry. But did he make any comments at all about the blunt force trauma? No, I don't think weak. Yeah, um, let me get to that question. You know what, I'm trying to remember what question that one was. But I know that was in there, but I don't think he said too much on that. I think a lot of people are kind of glossing over that. And even my, myself, when I first heard it, I kind of glossed over it. So it was good that you kept bringing it up and, you know, kept people on it. Because the more that you, that you look at it, the more it's like, oh, yeah, there's something, yeah, something fishy I mean, there it, now. Yeah, it's so clear and it is so obvious that there is trauma to that skull cap. And the fact that, you know, these quote unquote professionals just ignored all of that. Um, I, and I'm not sure why that I would kind of like to hear. Oh, yeah, see possible dog activity. I'm sorry, I jumped, but reading his comments, blue blanket over David's leg, possible dog activity. I'm telling you, paleo was really good at you know, putting blankets very neatly over these guys and, you know, moving the bodies quite nicely. Uh, that poor dog. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was covering them up, keeping their toes warm. No problem. <laughs> okay, right there. I, okay, well, that's better. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You want me to go back a little bit? No, no, no. I, I, I was, okay. my head saw one thing and it said something else, so never mind. <laughs> All right. I'm going to force you to read this one way or the other. I know you You're are. I see how you are, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but are you are you saying there's not one that you don't believe at all that there is possibility that 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 uh, what what you see as blood 
blunt force trauma, you don't think there's a possibility that that's from the from the dog at all? No, there's no way. Do- I mean, <laughs> if a dog can make a bite mark in the shape of a diamond with a, a, a round circular indentation in the middle and a six-sided, um, I don't know, what's a six-sided diagram, you know, an impression with six sides that are mm-hmm. about an inch and a half to two inches, I say, wow, that, that's, that dog is just impressing me more by the day. Could that impression be from the from the gun or anything? Or? No, no. When you look at that and, and you look at a, a, a the gun, um, the barrel is round. It just has a circular hole. But these impressions on that scalp are, have um, they're four sided, six sided, and one that has kind of a diamond shape to it. But I think that might be the same four sided tool that was used that could have hit the scalp in just a different way um, Mm -hmm. where it kind of smushed it together. But there are definitely, those are definitely some type of um, tool impression and tool being whatever struck the head. And, and Catherine, just to clarify uh, for for, uh, Greg, uh, Greg, that, that piece of skull, whether it's the inside or outside of the skull, is going to be flat and smooth. Um, think of it like a shell of an egg. Uh, when you crack open an egg, it you know opens up. That that inside is smooth, which is also like a skull, and the outside is smooth. There's going to be no dents or anything on that uh, or whatsoever. Now a gun, a gunshot is going to blow, you know the uh, the the bone fragments and break it and cause it to go into shards and and whatnot. Um, but it's not going to put a dent into the skull itself, and neither would a dog you know, chewing or, or biting on it. Those are indentations is what uh, Catherine is pointing out. Uh, and, and there's like 13 of such indentations, and that is not normal. But I don't think he touched on that at all. Yes, and, and Dan is, is correct. Um, it is, it's smooth it, to the extent of, well, there could be some rough edges, kind of like a textured wall, but a textured wall doesn't have designs in it per se. It doesn't have a wrench impression. It doesn't have a socket impression. Um, And the only other um, uh, uh, things that will be on a skull are what what are called foramen. And a foramen is simply just a hole. And those are the holes where the nerve endings go through and everything. Um, You have the big, huge one uh, the foramen magnum, which is the big one where the spinal cord goes through. But I'm talking about in the upper portion, portion of the skull and on the back where the occipital region meet, matches up with the parietal. Now, there are, well, you'll see one small hole on each side. And those are, again, those are just foramen. Those are normal. Those are natural. But those are holes. Those are not indentations. And, um, and again, I'm, I will harp on this, too. Again, is the part where you see straight skin, you see smooth, straight edges on the skin from that skull cap piece. And that, it is, cannot be done by a gun, cannot be done by a dog, cannot be done by a human ripping it off, and you know, because that would just be gross. But it is smooth and straight, and that is consistent with a knife. And with a knife being at the scene with blood, you would think that that at least this quote unquote private investigator would have looked twice at that. So I'm pulling up, uh, we got up number, uh, question number three, and I think that's where, um, where the blunt force trauma comes in. Blood, splat, blood spatter is medium velocity due to blunt force trauma and flows in at least four directions. And he says, I am not a blood spatter expert, but everything I see is consistent with the gunshot wound to, to the head. Did, um, did Kenneth Maines get the actual photo, Dan? Do, do you know? Um, that shows the blunt force trauma and all that? Yes. I sent that in a secondary, okay. um, secondary email, the things that um, – that we as a group have found or discovered. Yep, not part of the police report, but we have found with the circles of those indentations and whatnot. 
Correct. Okay. And what I had sent to Dan that I, um, I'm not sure if I sent it to you, Greg, and you, Sophia, but um, when I read his comment about that, I called um, and spoke with the, the blood spatter expert, and they are an expert, um, and told them because they were the ones that, uh, I went in and I did my own research and I did my own um, schooling, so to speak, on blood spatter, but I um, made sure I sent what I had found in the photos to the blood spatter expert that I knew. And I read them his comment by, I'm not a blood spatter expert, but everything I see is consistent with a gunshot wound to the head. And the blood spatter expert said, I would stop right there as I am not a blood spatter expert. And they, they said, you're right. They're, they're 100% correct. They, they are not an expert and they have no idea what, they have no clue what they're talking about. And they are, their comment about it being consistent with a gunshot wound to the head is totally um, not in line with what the blood spatter shows at that scene. Um, a gunshot wound to the head doesn't go in four different directions, doesn't make, you know, um, a droplet that has elongated spines. It doesn't, you know, all these things that go along with the blood you see on the floor, that is not consistent with gunshot wounds. And so, um, you know, he just should have stopped at, I'm not a blood spatter expert, because he clearly does not understand what the blood was saying. Uh, I have a point, Mrs. Dan. Um, for those, uh, if he was, uh, you know, there's four, four gunshots wounds, three to Comel, one to Ranny. Uh, your point of saying that there's, they're going in four different directions, uh, he may have also, one could argue that they, if, if they were high velocity, for instance, they would have four different directions because there was four gunshots fired in that room. One could argue uh, that, could they not? Catherine, just a point of uh, contention. I'm just, I'm just being a devil's advocate. I know no, it's high versus low medium velocity. That, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up because the point is in the way that that blood is moving, the way the blood is on the floor, it shows movement. It shows someone was running or moving quickly, trying to dodge um, after, you know, as they're being shot or after they're being shot. Um, or being hit in the head or whatever. And um, again, most of that blood spatter is not from, a, from gunshot wounds. It is medium velocity, which only comes from blunt force trauma. And then that blunt force trauma, again, whichever victim it was or victims, someone was definitely moving. Now, could it be from all four of them? hey, it very well possibly could be, but they didn't test it all. So we don't know. We only know of um, whose blood belonged to who from the small areas that they did test. I wish they would have tested everything. That would have given us a much better picture of that crime scene. But they just kind of looked at the blood on the floor and said, okay, yeah, yeah, it's blood, it's blood on the floor from a gunshot wound. Again, just a total not doing their jobs. My uh, take. Here's, on it. here's a question, Catherine, and 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 see if with your background you might know the answer to this. But uh, do you think that that Kenneth Maines did his investigation from a point of a of a detective a detective work versus actually doing forensic analysis? Is that fair to say that there's a difference, or, or are those two the same thing? Oh, no, they're totally different. Um, as far as investigating, he didn't do it. From what I see, he didn't do any investigating at all. From, as far as giving an analysis and looking at what was written and then looking at it from a forensic perspective, I think it would be fair to say he did that, um, which is why I believe he came to the conclusion he did because um, he only looked at the documents and looked at the photos and then just gave a, an opinion based on the forensic evidence of, okay, these documents say this happened and okay, I kind of think it did. But I see nothing in what he had written and what I had read so far that even begins to prove he did any 
um, individual investigation into the case. Um, didn't you say he said he wasn't able to um, access other documents that he could only get what we gave him? He was. Uh, he think he thought that uh, what I provided to him, uh, which was everything that we have, um, was was enough for what he needed to come to his conclusion. Um, and he didn't think, because I asked him if there's anything more over and above that we received that he, as a private investigator, uh, could have warranted or could have requested to get, and he says, I don't think that's necessary. Well, I think, well, he may not think it's necessary, but I think it absolutely is necessary because I, I'm not sure because I'm not an investigator, but one would think that he could at least access the actual police reports and not the supplement reports like we ended up with. Um, so he could have gained a whole lot more information than what we did. And not to say that that information would have provided him with a different outcome than what they wrote in the reports. However, because we don't have that and because he didn't gain access to that, we don't know if there's anything else that is not consistent with this case. So we can't, you know, we're kind of left to say, well, we, we're just going to have to go with we don't know. And I'm not okay with that. You know, um, for what he charged and for what he, he says his credentials are, and I have no reason to not believe him, but he should have been able to gain access to more, you know, he, he should have been able to get more than what we did with just simple, I mean, with, and I don't want to say simple FOIA request because I'm sure you guys put a lot of work into that. And, um, but at the same time, he knows what to look for. He says that's his, his um, line of business. So he should have been able to think of something that we haven't thought of. Correct. Okay, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, which he might have had a few things in there. I think that maybe, I mean, not that we haven't thought of, but things that maybe weren't mentioned, but a lot of that stuff, or all of it really, um, goes back to... Uh, um, saying that David Crowley is guilty where, you know, he's talking about, even in question, question one, where the re, you know, we're talking about, okay, why would the gun be by David, David's left hand? And, you know, it kind of goes into the same thing. Well, it could be the dog, you know, because of the dog, it's hard to really get that, but he's very clear to say, uh, you know, I will say if it was a, a staged suicide, the gun would have been placed in David's right hand. But David didn't have the right hand. So uh, that wouldn't, I don't know, it's almost like, uh, it's kind of and, I want, and again, I want to take, um, I, I want to just say I disagree with his comment on this. The gun would have been placed in David's right hand. I totally disagree with that. And um, the reason why is because um, as an EMT, and I even see it in some of the police reports, the way it was written, um, people tend to forget, unless you do it on a daily basis, when you're walking up to a patient that's lying prone on a floor or sitting up and they're facing you, you're, um, you're going to assume that their left is their right. Because most people, you know, it's, it's just automatic what the brain does. So it was ingrained in us, and we had to constantly repeat, our right is the patient's left. Our right is the patient's left. So the fact that the gun was on the left side makes sense to me. It makes total sense for a staging of the gun, because when they're going to drop that gun on the floor, they're doing it with their right hand, and they're going to drop it not thinking ahead like, oops, that's his left hand, it's going to register to them that it's his right hand because it's on their right side. And he should know that. He's a, a supposed investigator, and that is like crime scene 101. All right, let's see here. Yeah, um, seems, uh, yeah. kind, of, kind of the overall feeling I got, uh, this is Dan, as the overall feeling by reading the report is some of these questions were over his head. And I thought, and I, one, it made me think that maybe we're asking some of the, um, maybe the wrong questions or asking them the wrong way because 
he was answering those. I think we got it, would have gotten the same answers uh, if we sent this to the Apple Valley Police Department, the detectives there who, who handle one homicide a year. Uh, it's kind of the answer is kind of similar to that. The reason that I went after and hired him in the first place because he was uh, one of the nation's leading private investigators. And so I guess I was, I was looking for more of a, of a uh, robust uh, response in some of these answers rather than just yes, no, or I disagree or I agree uh, to, to your point, Catherine. Yeah, and, and I agree with that totally. And I'm looking at too at, at, at number four, the bloody footprint show cleaned up lead when sprayed. And he says, I do not believe this is true. There were visible bloody prints, but they were enhanced with chemicals, which is standard procedure. <laughs> and this just leads me to, to believe he did not look at the photos. Because when you look at those photos and then you compare them with the, um, I forget what they used, but the luminol type yeah. product, um, mm -hmm. you clearly see a difference. There is so much more blood that is on that floor that is brought up due to the chemicals than what you see with your naked eye. And that is not the case with actual blood that's left on the floor that would be visible. It is clearly, I mean, you see swipe marks, you see cleaned up spots, and there's no dog tongue marks in, in this blood, not to be crude, but they try to blame this poor dog for everything. So obviously the dog didn't lick it up. Obviously, yeah, what? Couldn't that be due, couldn't that be due to, to, what they, to what they sprayed, to how they laid down the little glossy uh, foam or, or film Right, they they laid that down. Everything is gonna kind of squish. Now, I'm I really think you I I would disagree with you on on number four. I don't think that this was cleaned up blood. I don't see that. Well, and <laughs> okay, um, let me go and ask you: How many times have you actually used this type of product to bring blood out to the forefront? Zero. Okay, I have, and and to. This is why I'm telling you, I am looking at this from um, like a clinical standpoint. You are looking, when you first look at that, those quote unquote footprints on the floor, which I, I still don't believe they're footprints. <laughs> you still going to debate me on that. Okay. I will. I, I not, yeah. That, and that's okay. That's what I like about yeah. it. You, you have yeah. no problem giving it back. And I love that about you. Um, but the fact still, when you're looking at those prints, on the floor and you see circles and then you see a line down from the bottom of that and you see what is an attempt at a ridge um a foot does a, the the ball of the foot does not make that type of imprint there will be more included the like more of the ball of the foot and the toes generally don't leave a line between where the, um, the the tip of the toe and then the ball of the foot meet. It's usually like the ball of the foot and then you have circles, so to speak, except for the big toe. Um, and then you look at what's on that floor and you see a circle with a line down, a circle with a line down, and it looks, um, and it's not even skeletonized blood, you know, and that's part of the, so they can't even say that it's that the blood was dried and then part of it flaked off and blew away and then that's why it's not there. Um, because there is other skeletonized blood spatter on the floor in multiple areas, meaning where drops of blood were, it dried, the middle dried and blew away, either whatever, if the dog was running by or the heat kicked on, but it left a hole in the middle. And when you compare that with these so-called prints, and then you, you realize there's something seriously wrong with this picture. And then when they spray it, now all of a sudden, you see far more blood that was on that floor that you now see, because it's microscopic or, or from <clears throat> being cleaned up. You know, it's kind of, you, and then you compare that with what you see on the picture previously, they don't match because you go from having a slight print to the sprayed areas now quite solid with blood. That is a huge problem for me. 
Catherine, uh, this is Dan. Do you think that uh, some could interpret uh, his response there by saying that there was perhaps multiple bloody footprints throughout the house, but only the three or four showed up that they elected to spray? Uh, is that could someone take it and interpret it that way? Um, that's why there's only a few out there. You know, I don't know if that's what he's saying here, but I think that's a valid point. If there were footprints to begin with, I think that's a very valid point. But again, they didn't spray enough of the house to really find out. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Because all we see in the photos is uh, th that's also what raises the confusion level or question for us, our group, is that uh, why would there just be three uh, so-called footprints uh, near the kitchen island and there's zero footprints down the hall, in the office, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, by the dishwasher. There's just a couple by the a laptop that are very convenient that uh, kind of pins it on the person writing these uh, notes, which is uh, allegedly David. Or, exactly. or, or are there true uh, footprints throughout the house, but the section they elected to spray the luminol, essentially whatever that uh, chemical is, was just in that area that makes the, those come to life, uh, those come to light. Um, and I'm not a, I don't, I don't have a background in that, so I don't know. Is that something that would also uh, be more visible once they spray it? And maybe there are other footprints throughout the house. I didn't, I didn't see any, but how, wouldn't they be easy to see throughout the house with or without luminol? Um, if it's um, invisible to the eye, you truly would need the luminol. Uh, and so when, like when we're looking at the floor in a lot of these photos, they had, um, and I don't think the photographer meant to do this, but they did do a pretty good job at taking things at an angle. So if you're looking at that floor from an angle, um, you see where the blood is, you see where the quote unquote prints are, but you look further out and you don't see anything other than a clean floor. So in that case, if there were anything, then yes, they would need to spray it. But um, and my question has always been, what could they have missed or what could they have found if they had actually sprayed more of that house? You know, what story would that have told everyone? Well, how would how would that work? Where they just were they just go around spraying certain areas or something, and just to see if there's anything there? How does this process work? Well, when I talked to um, the blood spatter um, expert, they said, in fact, that was one of the first questions. First of all, they would need to take the swabs, which they did, because oftentimes the luminol will. Um, ruin the blood samples, so they need to get all their samples first. But then, yes, they said that they're surprised that they actually, the vast majority of that living room was not sprayed and was not put under those lights, the blue lights or whatever they call them, black lights or whatever they use to bring up the luminol. Um, and that was something, for one, they said they would have used the string to find out where um, the blood spatter was leading from, and then they would have, once they had, they would have used the string, they would have taken their samples, and then they would have sprayed almost the entire living room to see if there was more of a story, um, like was blood cleaned up, or was there invisible blood, or, you know, are you going to see the void patterns? Because obviously, you know, we've talked about this before, where there's a lot of blood on the on the chair, and there's blood spatter on the floor and a little bit on the rug, but then some on the wall, but then everything else is totally clean. Why is that? And that's what they said they would have looked for. Or in other words, uh, spraying and seeing if, uh, if, if results come up and then uh, going farther down the hallway until it uh, diminishes essentially, right? Correct. Something like that, okay. Um, so, Sophia, do you have any um, thoughts on this so far before we move on to the next question here? I mean, the whole scene looks staged. Agreed. Overstaged, actually. Yes. Like they just kept going back and just redoing things and 
But the gun placement, I think, was her biggest screw-up. Why do you say that? Left hand. He's not left-handed. Even if he held it with both hands, for it to land that way is... I just don't see it as plausible. But, I mean, I've been saying this ever since I looked at all the documents that this whole thing is staged. I'm having a hard time uh, thinking about what could what would take his right hand off. Why would his right hand be missing? Because obviously, to to me, it seems like the fact that his right hand is missing is why you couldn't put the gun next to his right hand. That would look kind of like what Maines is saying. That would look staged, right? You know that make that's a good point. That's probably what they were thinking. <laughs> you know, and then come to realize it's like going, well, no, <laughs> what you did well, yeah. was staged. <laughs> right, because when they start thinking about how he's going to shoot himself with his left hand, and then if the bullet is going to uh, where it's where it's going to go through through his head and everything, it's a very very tough shot. It's similar to Philip Marshall. It's diff- a little bit different, but very very similar. To where it's like that's a that's a stretch that's a big stretch to really say that he would take that risk and not just use his right hand or just you know the the way that that the gun is pointed and where where the bullet travels from what they say it just seems like a big big uh, risk to take if you really want to kill yourself. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's correct. And the Philip Marshall in California. Um, that alleged suicide, the gun was found underneath his body, kind of essentially uh, the body was laying on the floor in the uh, hallway in the by the front entrance, and it's almost as if someone kind of lifted up part of his body and kind of shoved it underneath there with their foot, kind of just shoved it underneath. And I've never heard of a uh, gun or a pistol or handgun after a suicide being under any part of a body at all, much less. Usually it's, you know, it's by the near the scene and also near the hand that was used after the weapon dropped. And his was kind of shoved under the body, which I think also sent a message of, that it was obviously a hit. Um, this one's just laying by the wrong hand, and like Sophia said, it was an overstaged scene. Um, so that was that was strange. I do think that uh, Kenneth Maynes did go and uh, ass- not assume um, – try to rationalize each of the things that we thought were staged. And he kind of came back with the answer, well, you know, well, why would they do this? And if it was staged, it obviously would have been like this. And a suicide note would have obviously looked like this. And the gun would have been obviously here. And, you know, so he kind of went through the steps of eliminating the fact that it could have been staged because someone staged in the scene obviously wouldn't do those things. And I disagree with his analysis, although it's, it's rational, it makes sense. Um, but he kind of used that to kind of back into the fact that, well, obviously David did do it because if someone staged it, they wouldn't have done any of these things because they did them all wrong. Therefore, David did it. It's kind of how he deduced. He came to his conclusion. And I think that's, uh, that's weak. Weak is all I'm saying. Yes. But, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sophia. Um, do you? Were you familiar with the exercises that the military would run like once a year where they would go into like, for instance, like um, mock wars and and mock mock exercises for different situations? Yes. And they would set the stage and everything? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, this is what this crime scene reminds me of. And how the police went in, they did all the steps that they would for a triple homicide or that kind of thing. I cannot get that thought out of my mind of how this reminds me of these mock wars and and uh, exercises that we went through each uh, so, year. Sophia, someone in the chat room mentioned that it, it's similar to a Jade Helm exercise. Yeah. Yes, but for the first responders. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we would have stuff like this all the time um, that we would, uh, sometimes they would do it um, 
at the same time our yearly test needed to be done to get recertified or are they every three years we needed to get recertified and sometimes you know it would be done at different times so we'd have to do it twice um, but yes um, yeah there are there are mock mass casualty scenes and mock ma yeah, generally is what we would do the the mass cal scenes but yeah I, I had to take part in several of those and I you know I had not thought about that but you're correct this looks a lot like that type of scenario and it's just hard to get it out of my mind when I look at everything and I see all the steps that the police did. They went in, they observed the scene, they went through the motions, but then they took it a step further. You know, they ran the DNA test, they closed up the case, that kind of thing. And that's the, I'm so torn between this being faked or being real. You know, I, I just cannot find that extra piece of evidence to prove it one way or another. And I don't know. I'm yeah. sure there's other people that feel the same way that I do. And I'm not ashamed of how I feel, though. It's, it just has a couple... It's hard to explain. It just it feels kind of fake, but at the same time, there's still three bodies that were in that living room. So, what happened? Right. And the way that they're telling us to stop asking questions, to stop digging, and just accept this crappy narrative. Well, it gives us. Fancy. Hey, Kelsey. I'm a little late coming on, but I'm I'm here. Uh, Yay! I believe awesome. it's overkill. It's too much overkill, and I don't think David would have done that. I really don't. No, I, and I agree with you. I mean, with as much as he loved and protected his wife and daughter, and every other um, place where he's on video, where he's filmed with his family, or, you know, he protected them. He's put his body between him and, and the people he was comfortable with. That is not a man who's going to turn around and do that to his wow. wife. And, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, and I was going to ask you guys, too, this was something I was doing some research on, and maybe somebody who has, like, some soldiers out there or something who were actually over in Iran or Iraq, um, there was something that they said was called um, when you Mozambique someone, and that what the what the research was saying is that when, instead of a double tap, they're shot three times, and that is a special type of an assassination, and it's usually almost almost virtually done a hundred percent of the time by someone in the military. So that tells me that whoever took part in this, if that's, if that's even a thing, or maybe the research I was reading is completely wrong, but whoever was part of this, could that be why the, Kamel had sustained three shots? I think it was Sean Wright who said that this was a double tap. Yeah, but... You know, and clearly there are three bullets with her her hair and skin on it and uh, tissue and, and hair. Um, so, you know, yeah, and it, yeah, Sean Wright. Oh, God, just don't even get me started. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, <laughs> but I, I don't. Keep it know. Simple, sorry. I know, yeah, but if anybody out there who's listening, if you are you know, previous military, is there such a thing as Mozambiquing someone? And if so, how is that generally done? Well, isn't that two to the chest, one to the head, or am I getting it backwards? No, you're correct. Usually two to the chest, one to the head. But if they, if a, you have a target that's moving, I don't know if maybe they just went for whatever was easier. True. Very true. So I don't know. That's what I, I'm just. I'm kind of curious because it's just something I started reading about, and I just want to know if there's any validity to that research by actual soldiers who have served overseas. 
But I do want to I do want to say that number five. I want to bring some attention to that where we're talking about the um, the bullet hole in the ceiling wasn't seen until a month later, and then. I do have to say I appreciate his comment on this one, his response being true. To me, it appears to be an oversight, which happens, does not mean it was done out of conspiracy or malice. And that's how that has always sat with me. Like the police were kind of embarrassed that they missed it. So they just have always said, well, okay, um, yeah, it was there all along. When in reality, it wasn't. It was an oversight. I, I don't know. Was it there? That was it not there? But that, his, his, his answer really bothers me on that okay. for so okay, many reasons. Okay, tell me why. Well, okay. one, because cause every, every, other, every other person in law enforcement that I have asked um, ha, has thought that, that that is one of the weirdest things. That's one of the strangest things. Okay. I don't know how many have how many law enforcement people have has everybody else asked, and do they also agree with Kenneth Maines that hey, this happens? It's an oversight, really. I, it's, I have a big issue with that. But of course, I'm not in law enforcement. I have no idea about their training. So, well, you're but, hey, you're, also, you're go ahead, Pansy. He said he also said that that was the bullet that killed him, but it and it had his DNA on it, but it didn't. I mean, it had his uh, prints on it, but not any blood or hair. Yeah, it had DNA, but they didn't tell us where that DNA came from. We only know that it what did not come from blood because they swabbed it for blood and didn't find any. So how could that have? And I agree with you. So how could that have been the bullet that killed him? Yeah, but he agreed that it was. Yeah, okay, so, you're right. So, so I don't agree with him on that at all. Yeah. I think that's a huge mistake. But good points, Greg. Thanks thanks for explaining. That makes so much more sense. Ah, uh, yeah, that one is just okay. Um, let's Keep moving on here. I, I guess the, the other thing that bothers me about number five is that it's like nobody said anything about a conspiracy or malice. This is just, you know, this is this should just be common sense to me. I, I don't under I don't understand that. But anyways, um, the good fact point. is that, that they, they yeah, Greg, that's a good point. This, Go is, uh, this is Dan. When I talked to Kenneth Maines, uh, when I communicated with him, never once did I suggest that it was a Cover up by police or a conspiracy by uh, police or or malice or officers not doing their job. I just said, here's what we got. Here's what we think uh, potentially happened, um, and we just want the truth. So a couple times he does mention that he can't believe or he calls it preposterous that the police would all cover this up, and that's part of my response back to him is going to cover that exact same point by saying I never. I don't think anyone, uh, any of us ever said that the police were in, involved in a cover-up down to the very level of detail uh, of each detective. Maybe at but the higher up where... level, a very, a very few people at the very top level may have been compromised. I do agree with that, um, but I don't think there's a cover-up of the police uh, with you know involving 100 different agents, detectives, and uh, investigators. And this is where watching that documentary comes into play because it talks about the group and the admins being conspiracy theories. And I don't think that anything in that paperwork that you sent him even had conspiracy stuff in it. I think no. it was all the files, wasn't it? It's just, just the files uh, from police and then the, uh, various investigative uh, work that the group did, uh, whether it be in video format or uh, other type of research. Mm -hmm. but, but nothing as far as what we think happened as far as theories. I don't. I didn't send him anything as far as theories. No, but he kind of insinuated that we did. Exactly. That's what, that's what I don't like. Right. It's probably after watching the documentary. Mm-hmm. Because like Was Sophia said, it really needs down the angle that we're uh, thinking that it's, uh, you know, a, a police cover-up, and that's not what was done. Eric Nelson himself, you know, uh, went after that angle to make us look like that's what we were saying. 
we were just saying the evidence doesn't support what the official narrative is, and we want to hire and, and get someone out there to find out what really did happen. We don't we don't know we don't know what happened. That's the problem. Did um did Kenneth Maines ask for anything at any point, or was or was it just that you would give him stuff and just did, did at any point did he ever ask for any specific? document or fact or anything like that? Um, he, he asked a couple uh, clarifying um, points, but that was about it, just to make sure he understood, you know, some of the documents. Um, and I was thinking the whole time uh, when he was, when I was giving him information and he was responding, um, that he was very open in doing his job. It wasn't until the very, very last question I asked that, that he asked me um, that I got to thinking that maybe he's going along with the official narrative. It really wasn't until the very end. And he says, he said, Dan, do you have anything else that uh, confirms their religion and, and how they got along uh, with their Christianity and the Muslim angle? And I thought to myself, well, that's strange. Why would he ask? Why would that even come into play unless you're going down the official narrative route? And so um, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what gave me the very first inkling that he wasn't, um, really overturning every stone in his case. He was just kind of, if that was his question, uh, which I think is a non-question in this entire case, and that, that, that was a bizarre question to me that someone of his uh, caliber would be asking. Uh, uh, I kind of figured at, at that point that it wasn't going as in-depth as what I thought this investigation would be doing. Right. I don't think he ventured out very much to find anything any different. Correct. I do agree with that. Um, anything else before we move on here to number seven, to the fruit of our labors? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> wow. I was going to say right. something else, but I held that. Um, because what I what I'm noticing here, okay, in some of these questions, everybody should go through these these questions. Forty eight questions, forty nine questions. Go through these. See when he gives more detailed answers. On number seven, this is like a paragraph. This might be one of the biggest answers that he really gives here. And we're just talking about fruit, right? We're just talking about okay, fruit looks looks fresh. Um, obviously, there's other things on that counter that kind of look like, you know, there's like, uh, there's egg shells, there's butter out, there's bread out, there's whatever else out, all this, of this different stuff out. And he spends a lot of time here. I think a lot of time, this might be the biggest uh, answer, the longest answer that, that he gives, at least so, so far, it definitely is. So well, and what I find, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you Go off. For it. But what I find interesting about his answer is he says, I would want to determine that first and then conduct an experiment in the controlled te temperature and environment. And that's what we've been doing, remember, with the fruit, some with kiwi, a lot of us with the bananas. And then we some have actually um, chastised us for doing that. <laughs> and he himself said he would do the same thing, that he would conduct an experiment. But I think even with all of our experiments, even with, you know, all the different variances in temperature people have used, we still, those bananas did not last three, four weeks. Nobody got, you know, other than I think one person whose house, but they had an average temperature of maybe 60 degrees, which is a far cry from 68. Um, so theirs lasted the longest, but, you know, I, I find it interesting that, um, you know, he, he would have conducted an experiment. And, well, why didn't he? I mean, he, he was doing this for a while. Why didn't he do an experiment? Should, should we ask him to do a 20, 23 day <laughs> experiment on the, uh, get some kiwis and, you know, put some oil in a frying pan and. <laughs> See what happens. Some coffee, right? We got the coffee there too. Oh so, yeah, yeah. Right. We did get chastised um, about a lot of that. Before. What did you find out about the coffee? I'm sorry. I, I know I'm off topic here, but um, I kind of dropped coffee, off coffee. the radar. Yeah, my my coffee mold molded at about two and a half weeks. Of course, I get organic coffee, so I'll have to go back and see what type of coffee 
they had. But, you know, people people do kind of chastise us for these things. But, you know what, these are simple tests that anybody can do that will help. It will help. So whether it makes us look, you know, silly for even asking this question, fine. But let's get some clear answers on it. Yeah. And, and, and you can't do that if you don't take the time to do these tests. So somebody sure. still, you don't know. You don't know how old those bananas were when they right. uh, like when they got them. How long had they sat there before they were killed or died? Correct. So we have no idea, really. Yeah, and and I know when I did the the banana experiment, I got I bought like um, I bought organic and regular, and I bought like. Some half green, half ripe, and then I also bought some that were actually on the ripe side to begin with. And so, cause, like you said, we didn't know. So I figured I'd try all of it. That's right, and thank you for that. Uh, anything else on the fruit before we move on to number eight here? All right, so let's look at number eight. Back door was ajar, one fourth of an inch, according to police reports. This could be signs of something, but again, it could be nothing. Well, it is definitely a sign that there was no need to look for any type of uh, struggle or anybody forcing their way into the house. Doesn't this show that somebody had clear access into the to the house? We, later on, we will get into one of the questions about that there was a kitchen window, um, which uh, the the Depending on which report he got, if he got the, the 467 report, that information about the, the kitchen window might not be in there. But in the most recent one that we do have, the 488-page document, which I would love to give to him and have him actually go through it and read it, um, that one does show it. And, of course, he doesn't need to read the whole thing. We can send him one little clip that, that shows that. But that would say you have two op two things open. Why are the police even talking about? Um, or, and why are they making such a big deal? Almost every every cop, uh, and and the ones that didn't put it in their police report, they were clear to go back and say, hey, I forgot to mention this. We didn't find any signs of force of people forcing their way in. They, I mean, they go to extreme lengths <laughs> to point that out, and they gloss over this kind of the same way he's glossing over it. Yeah, and that right there shows to me that the police were writing from a script or from their crib notes that they have because, like you said, it doesn't matter um, because they could have, whoever did this, could have gained entrance into that house a myriad of ways. Were they let in? Did they come in through the back door while um, David or Kamel were trying to take out trash? We don't know any of this. Um, and just because there's no forced entry means absolute squat. It's like they watch too much TV. I think that may be a training um, thing because everyone goes to that first. Yeah, the photographer um, took about 15 photos of that front door. I think as a you know a checklist off there are things to do in training without taking a step back and realizing we have a back door that's open um, we no longer need 15 photographs of the front door. And e each of the detectives go out of their way to talk about the fact that there was no forced entry. Uh, more of a checklist of their things to do as being a detective um, versus the common sense things that we're looking at from a much larger picture, what could and what could not have happened here. Um, no one cares about the forced entry. We All these people that that we're thinking could have been potential suspects would have uh, been friends with David and Kamel that would have been easily um, and let into the house in the first place Correct. or the back door. Correct. And so um, none of us have, have ever spent any time wondering if there was forced entry or not. And another thing that uh, the investigators will do is if, if uh, expensive electronics and, and valuables are stolen, then they can go in the directory of, you know, was it a robbery? And so they, they go from, they start deducing things like that um, as well as part of their training, I think. That's just my opinion. I think they're doing that because of training, because that one individual who didn't do the force entry went back later and made sure that that was in the report. Uh, and maybe they're 
maybe they're graded on these types of things too that uh, you know but uh, we're just looking at it from a from an investigation point of view uh, we don't care necessarily about what the rules and regulations and what they're supposed to do for their checklist to make sure they checked everything we're just looking at the case from a common sense point of view and none of this adds up correct I agree and his number of Kenneth Mann's heavy background is as a police detective is where he spent most of his time and then he later got into investigations so I think what I see in reading his report is a lot of checklist uh, types of things um, deduction types of things um, not he's not looking at it from a critical thinking point of mind uh, from someone on the outside looking in um, using critical thinking or what, what we're doing um, he's he's also another person I think that's just going off of a, a checklist or a textbook or a manual to get to the answer and that's where we as a group think that the Apple Valley Police Department failed and that mean that that may very well be the reason why they failed is, is because they were doing that which gets back to uh, Greg's quote that maybe we have a training uh, issue here I think those training and textbook manuals are good for normal everyday situational types of crimes but not on a high level crime like this which is way out of the scope of anyone that they got to look at this from all different angles and which Kenneth Baines was told specifically from the very onset to this investigation that we have multiple things not just one or two inconsistencies here we've got 30 40 different things that don't line up at all that's why we're asking these questions um, we're not just conspiracy folks here coming up with things out of the blue and things in random uh, at the top of our head these are uh, scientifically and uh, forensically uh, already proven things that either did or did not happen that do not agree with the official police narrative. That's why we're hiring him to um, expose the weakness in the investigation that I certainly think uh, was very weak. Agreed. Absolutely agree. Um, okay, number number nine, and it looks like number ten is actually the answer to number nine. Is that? Is yeah, that that's what I see too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was like, why didn't he answer two questions? <laughs> like, what's going on in here? How dare you? But okay, that, you know. But still, it's like okay. Um, the, I I think we need to. This might. I'm going to write this down. I'm writing down some of the things that we'd like to clarify with him on, because the neighbor might not have been sure, but the neighbor was able to give a certain date, and I do believe that the neighbor was sure that she saw this door open on December 21st. And there's no indication that the door was open or, or closed any time between December 21st and when the bodies were actually found. So uh, that kind of might that might be a good one to clarify with with him on that the the neighbor not only didn't see anybody in the house, there was no activity in this house past December 21st unless you look at uh, the neighbor across the street. But aside from that, the house was dark. Nobody saw anybody there. I think that's a big, big thing that also gets kind of over overlooked, like what was going on in this house uh, in December that it's so quiet, nobody sees anything, but yet they're all there. They find activity. They find, I think it's either Internet activity. I do I do believe that they find some of some of that all the way up until December 26th, but they're not giving us dates. They're not showing us, well, there was activity on this date, activity on that date. It sounds like there was nothing going on in that house as far as neighbors could actually see with the, with the back door open. Now, this neighbor also says that she wasn't sure that if it was the back door or the back screen door that was open, but it was open, and she does not say that it was one-fourth inch. It was open. Yeah, just to just to clarify, uh, Greg, that's a good, that's a huge point. So for the listeners out there, uh, the neighbor from the backyard, their view from the backyard would not be able to notice, you know, a quarter inch uh, door being open. She specifically said, I think that the door was open a, a, a foot or two feet, you know, wide, wide, widely open or certainly open. And uh, like my my personal screen door that I've got for my uh, reader slider. 
uh, in the wintertime, they're usually both closed. Uh, either that screen door is, is pulled all the way shut, or sometimes I'll leave it all the way open. But that other door, the glass pane, is all, also all the way shut or all the way open. So what she saw um, would, was important in the fact that it was open. I think it's less important that, that she couldn't clarify if it's the screen or the glass because it's winter. Um, I'm guessing it was the glass. Um, but it doesn't make a difference. After that time that she saw it and, until the police got there, the, the width of the open door, whether it's a screen or the glass, was different than how they found it. Uh, yeah, so the and, question and is, this is, yeah, yeah that, that's the question, that, and that's a good, that's a very good point. Yeah, because she, she, I mean, if you really look at the way that that report is actually written, it makes you want to hear the testimony that she gives him, because it almost sounds like this report is kind of summarizing it. They're kind of feeding her to say, well, she wasn't sure. But if you look at what it says first, it seems like she was sure. And then they're kind of like, well, no, she wasn't really sure if it if it was this or if, if it which which door it was. When she, when they first talk to her, it sounds like she's telling them that the back door was open. And then they go back and they say, well, she wasn't sure if it was the door or the screen. I think this is why the actual transcript of what these people are saying is so important to this case. It's so important for us to uh, to to find that stuff, to be able to have access to it, because it might help clear up these questions. Agreed. Yep. All right, so we move on to 11. The knife tested positive for blood of all three, yet it was not visible. Appears to have been washed and no prints on the knife. Uh, not true, he says. Lab report stated there was a mixture of DNA from two or more individuals. David Kamel and Rania cannot be excluded as possible contributors of the DNA. You will not always get prints from items. That is just the reality of it. It sounds <laughs> like he's actually he's saying, well, I mean, depending on how you read this, um, I've read this a few times. and. <laughs> And I'm sorry, Dan, what did you say? It's kind of a condescending answer the way I read it myself. Yes. And um, this was, <laughs> this was my question and then what I have found. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure that it's answered somewhere else unless I just read into the answer, which is totally a possibility. But the fact still remains is where the blood was located. It was located in a small crevice on the blade. It was located and then in a small circle that was um, part of the knife design. And then there was a little bit of blood on the blade. But other than that, it was quote unquote clean. I don't know what else to say. Um, and if there, when you hold something like a knife, you're going to leave your prints on it. I mean, it's, it's not like you can just touch stuff and it just disappears. Your DNA is gone. You know, if they say that they can pull DNA from a bullet fragment that was shot through a ceiling and, and bounced off, um, you know, the trusses in the, in the attic, and still come up with DNA. You mean to tell me that they can't find DNA from someone who was holding the knife? All right. You know, for a house that David lived in, his DNA and his fingerprints are surprisingly lacking. Yes, they're absent from just about everything. Oh man. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of side with with Kenneth Maines here only because of, of, the, of the question and the way that the question is phrased. It's almost like there was too much information in this, in this question. I feel like it's, of course, this is what it should have, could have, but it, it feels like this question should have been phrased in a different way. Okay. Um, so how should I have phrased of, it? Um, I think it should have been more, Hey, there was blood found here. There's blood found there. You know, doesn't that show signs of a possible struggle? Doesn't that show signs of um, somebody 
in a defensive mode, you know. But I, I think your your question was more towards the actual blood when it's kind of like, well, there is blood there. We know that there's blood there. We, we know that this blood cannot be conclusively tied to David Kamel or to Rania. I think that is really the big point there. He can he can talk about it being, you know, a mixture of two or or more people, but there's no indication that David Kamel or Rania are are one of the two or more people. Well, their DNA was found on it. I, I'm almost positive I remember that correctly. I will go back and look at that again. But the the reason why I put the comment as I did is because I never saw the knife being used as a way um, to intimidate um, and that someone would that they would find defensive wounds on someone from a knife. I see it in how everything else is played out, like the skull fragment and how that skin has you know, straight, sharp edges on that, the skin. I see it, the knife as an afterthought, something that was used after they died. Uh, so, and that's just my thought. I've never viewed it as something that was part of, of the actual murders, but used as, as a way to remove parts from the body. But there's no cuts. There's nowhere where we don't know that. anything being cut. We don't based know on that. The documents, but based on the documents that we have, there is nothing where they mention anything being cut, correct? Well, that's the problem. Of, because of the, you remaining, have, you of have the remaining, photos. Of remaining bodies, nothing was cut, correct? Right. right. But we have missing hands. We have, you know, and then when you're looking at that ulna and the radius, it's smooth, um, you know, uh, smooth edges to those bones. So we know the dog wasn't in there gnawing on it, pulling it off, but they try to say it happened. That hand came off somehow. So it wasn't pulled. But they do say, but at, at, yeah, at the same time that, that they do say that it, it was smooth, they do say that there were jagged um, things that made them think that may, maybe the dog ripped at his right arm and looking at that image you can kind of see that right it's not a clean cut definitely but again we don't have any foot we don't know and we do see the picture of the scalp where you see clear sharp edges on that skin and that that is what I'm you know that's also what I'm talking about that was an after the fact that was post-mortem whatever when they were deciding to to take their heads apart for whatever reason, um, that part of that scalp was cut away. And was that knife used? That is my question to them. In, and with, in, since it doesn't have enough of the blood, enough blood on it that you would think that type of activity would have caused, um, to me that shows that the knife was, was cleaned off or they attempted to clean it off, wipe it off or whatever. Um, and again, it could, it could, the blood could have ended up on the blade edge a, a number of ways. We, you know, we just have no idea how that got there because it was just a small area. But with the blood being in the places like the crevices, if it made it into the crevices but didn't make it all over the knife, that is a huge red flag. Okay, and then just, just to be clear here, go ahead, Ken. Uh, someone's fingerprints had to be on that knife. That's my thought. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just to be clear on item 8-1, which is that, that knife, um, yeah, like you said, there was a mixture of two or more people, and David and Kamel and Rania cannot be excluded. But here's where it gets, you know, where it says that, uh, 99999998 percent of the general population can be. So maybe that's where we're, maybe, Captain. Maybe that's where you're getting the idea that well, if it, if 99.9 percent .9 of the population can be excluded, who else could it could it be? And what that means in the in the medical term and in the terminology of a lab report, when it gives you that specific to that many points out of on a decimal point, they are telling you it virtually belongs 
the, the, the blood belongs to David Kamel or and Rania and or Rania. And since it's two or more individuals and there are three dead bodies there and they're all closely related, then that again it's by it's due this speed. by by double process double. of elimination. Yeah. Yeah, to me it, it it sounds like double speak. They're talking out of both sides of their of their mouth, basically. They're yeah, like, they're trying well, to yeah, they're trying to say, well, there's we can't tell you it belongs to them, but we know two or three people it does belong to or more people it belongs to. However, you basically can rule out the entire world population. But we're not gonna tell you it's David and Kamel. Now when they talk Jewish about this and then when they talk about this 99.9%, that was the other thing. Where are they getting this from? As a person like me who doesn't understand anything about this stuff, where are they getting this 99% from? It, are they including me in this? Are they including people in Minnesota? They where are, are they it, getting this number from? It, that's how the tests are done. It's kind of like similar with... Um, uh, actuarial kind of stuff, uh, uh, Greg. It's not a random, can you, it's not can a random you number, but it's... Statistics. Yes, it's, it is a statistical number, and it is basically telling you there. They use, like, if it had come back saying that they could rule out 80% of the population, that still means that there's a 20% out, populace out there that could have actually been the contributors, or it could be their blood on that knife. But when they use the terminology of 99. 99 or 99.998. In other words, that is lab speak for um, there is only a point zero 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 two or zero 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 one percent that it belongs to someone other than David Camelarania. In other words, it's theirs. It's their blood. But based on what? I mean, because it, like what I'm trying to say, am, am I included in this 99.9 percent? They have my DNA. Are they sure they have my DNA? No, 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 no. They don't have no, no, DNA. Okay. What are we talking? Okay, about? I see what you're asking now. No, no, no. It's not that they have your DNA. They're looking at certain markers in the blood, and that's how they tell people are related. And they're looking at this blood and looking at the markers and the chromosomes and the DNA and and all that other stuff. And how does that match up to the blood that they have from David and Kamel? And then if it's really close to that, then that's going to rule out the vast majority of people. So basically, they had a virtual almost 100% match between the blood on the knife and David, Kamel, and or Rania. So then by process of elimination, if their markers match that blood to such a fine point, then that by process of elimination would rule out the vast majority of everybody else on the planet. So, it, okay, look at it this way. You have a glass of pure orange juice and some of that orange juice, you know, spills or whatever, or is it diluted? And if they, they match up, they're going to test this. Does it match up with actual orange juice or is it orange juice mixed with Kool-Aid? The Kool-Aid being the other part of the populace. But if it's pure orange juice, then it obviously belongs to the orange and not the Kool-Aid jar. We are, in essence, the Kool-Aid jar. The populace, the general populace, are the Kool-Aid jar, and the family are the oranges. But since it was almost pure their DNA, their blood markers, it's, it's their blood. In other words, nobody else truly could be a contributor does not mean that they have your DNA. Dan, can you help me explain this? You're a, st you're a stats guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically they can't say that it's 100% not someone's blood or 100% or you know essentially so they they got to do this statistical analysis that shows that it's 99.9998 uh, you know certain that it's not someone someone else's blood so that's their way to get out of it because they can't say 100% it's kind of going back to uh, DNA and genetics and things like that. If you're tracing back your 
history roots, you know, you might be a 15% this and 25% that. So it's, it's the statistics that they use. It's just, that's the result that comes back when they push the button on the, on the, um, on the computer. Yeah. And, and look, the, the other way too is like when you have DNA tests done to determine um, who is someone's father, right? You take the mother and the daughter, you, you compare their blood, and then you have your sample of dudes out there. And the guy, one guy's going to come back with a 99.998% possibility of being that baby's father. In other words, that's the baby daddy. There is no, all the other guys can then at that point walk away. They're not, they don't even have, they can breathe a total sigh of relief because that is the father. So it's kind of the same way here. That blood came back as 99 point whatever percent as David Kamel and or Rania. So it was like a Maury Povich uh, reference right there. Who is yeah. the dad type of thing, right? That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It might be just I mean, as accurate. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bring Maury into it. <laughs> no, that's okay. I love Maury. Maury's awesome. Married to Connie Chung, too. How can you go wrong? Um, okay, so number 12, no apparent blood in the area around the knife. And his answer is, the knife may not have even come into play. There was no indication of stab wounds. Okay, first of all, the knife comes into play because the knife is there and the knife has blood on it. Thank so you. The knife is in play. And, and the knife is open. Thank you. If, if the knife was closed in somebody's pocket... I could see it could not come into play. But so we have two, I have two, I mean, obviously everybody else, you probably see the same thing. Two interesting answers here, right? Can I get your guys' view on this, on these answers that we're seeing here? Okay, Sophia, Dan, or Pansy, somebody jump in. <laughs> okay, I got a question again. Okay, go ahead. Question again. <laughs> I didn't hear it. Oh, I can I can jump in with I can jump in with mine. I think that he believes from reading the police report, which is I think all that all that Kenneth Maines did is that there's nothing that shows that the knife was in play during the uh, commission of this crime, and uh, that's why I think that he used that phrase. Now we know because we're taking a step back to look at it from a much bigger picture and using our critical minds to do that uh the apple valley police just said that there's a there's a gun there's bullet casings bullet fragments and people that died of bullet, bullet wounds um and yes there's a knife sitting there but that's got nothing to do with it so they just overlooked it and then he just repeated that and regurgitated by saying that um, i don't know what the knife's got to do with anything maybe it wasn't even in play uh during the commission of wow. this crime well that's just him agreeing with that and maybe it, it wasn't but the fact that greg's point was good there's a knife at the scene there's knife with right. the knife has blood on it and it's there even though it wasn't uh obviously used in somewhere uh it, with the shooting it was obviously used somehow in in something some uh you know it was it was right. in play it was it was used somehow the question is what we don't know that but he eliminated it, I think, just by saying that I read the report uh, 15 times and I don't think the uh, the knife was used. Well, that's not what we hired him for to regurgitate what the Apple Valley Police Department said. That knife is very important, I think, in this case. Go Agreed. And, and the thing, too, you have to keep in mind is, like, what are they going to do? Blame the dog on putting the knife next to David now? Oh, the dog took it off the table and dropped it next to David. He opened it, to, you know. And it's like, come on, use your brain. Just because there were no indication of stab wounds does not mean a knife wasn't used. There are Correct. more types of ways to use a knife other than to stab. Right. I'm sorry, Pansy. Go ahead. I, well, I said right, but, you know, he had this deal about the dog uh, covering everybody up with these blankets and uh, <laughs> one of them uh -huh. on it and all this other. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> oh, man. Dog covered them up. You're right. 
the dog covered David up and he, he tucked it gently under uh <laughs> Ronnie and them and uh, you know the dog did his thing. <laughs> Um, Any other thing on on the knife, um, Sophia? Anything else we want to add about the knife? I think it actually is important because it's like you all have said. It's there, laying amongst three bodies. It's open, so it should be included, and everybody just glossed over it. But yeah, screw it. We got a knife there, but you know, we're not going to look at the knife. We're not going to look up. We're not going to look at the ceiling, apparently. So you know, just Paleo opened it while he was playing amongst everything and tearing up toys, and so yeah, we're just going to discard it because the dog did it. Yeah, he got yeah, tired of playing with that raccoon, so he decided to play with the knife. <laughs> Smart dog. And the blanket. He can open up the knife. Yes, and the blanket. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so number 13, writing on the wall does not match David. This cannot be determined, is what he answered. Writing with a pen or pencil during the course of your everyday routines is very different than smearing something on this wall. You cannot compare handwriting to something painted or smeared on an area. The fact is, the fact is, they could not tie that writing on that wall to David Crowley, and he glosses over that. So, uh, again, Correct. there might be a question of maybe maybe the question wasn't phrased right, but anybody looking at this question would have come and, and see, well, wait a minute. Yeah, he's, he is right. It cannot be determined. So that means how did they say that David – wrote anything on this wall they only took two samples they took two samples and they did nothing with them nothing correct i can uh this is dan i can clarify this i i believe um item 13 i think can be taken two ways one greg was what you say that his answer was that it, it can't be tied or can't be matched to david um i agree with that because the report said that uh, uh, I don't know what the report said. There's David's DNA was on that wall, I think, which we for someone living in the house, his DNA no. should be all over that wall. So no, only, my question only, was only Camels, only Camels. Um, D- David's David's uh, DNA was on the living room wall, right? That was in the police report. I didn't read no. that. Oh. No. Okay, because so we know it's we know it's Comel's blood that's on the wall. Correct. But they thought from the from the forensics of Buffalo Valley Police, they found David's DNA on that wall. Therefore, mm-hmm. they thought that he did the writing of the blood, which I do not agree with. But I do think it said somewhere in that 94-page report that uh, the test came back and his DNA was on that wall, and that could have been a skin cell transfer from him, um, you know, moving the couch or. Uh, nailing a clock uh, on the wall and doing moving furniture. Uh, his DNA is probably all over that wall. So that's not a conclusive way to deduce that. Now, what I sent to Kenneth Maines was my personal video on YouTube that I did showing David's handwriting and saying David's writing doesn't match what's on that wall. And I think this is what he's referring to on number 13 is you can't determine it. And I agree with what he's saying from a textbook perspective uh, writing with a pen or pencil on a piece of paper is one thing. Writing on the wall is completely different. I agree with him there that you can't do that. Uh, you can't okay. make that jump. That's what that I think he's sense. referring to here, that it doesn't match. It doesn't match gotcha. his writing. Now, I could also go another a step further that, you know, it's all capitals, therefore David writes uh, in lowercase, so, so it doesn't make sense. I do think some of those letters are written with someone's left hand, uh, and David is not left-handed, so his should all be written if he did indeed do it, which we know that he didn't do it, all be right-handed. Some of those letters do look like uh, they're written by a left-handed person and a right-handed person. Uh, right, so and that, that was the whole point. That was the point so I question. totally missed that. Qu- okay, that was, that was my fault. I totally misunderstood the question. Yeah. And see, and that was my point. It, it, what you just said, when I said the writing on the wall doesn't match David, it doesn't. When you look at that A, 
David has a very specific way of writing his capital A's. And and the, I will take um, issue with when he says you cannot compare to something painted or smeared. That is incorrect. People are going to follow the same. Um, if they write yeah. up, down, and sideways on paper, they're going to write up, down, and sideways on a wall. You're going to still follow. Your handwriting is your handwriting. Now, it will look a little different, but the A's and the B's, and the K's are like night and day. Totally different. The, stro the strokes it make, is what you go by. The strokes. Correct. Strokes. Thank you. That's the word. I thought I it was only Camel's DNA on that wall. That's what I thought. Correct. Correct. That is correct. And, and they, they took two samples, only did one test. Oh. So, great job, again. Um, okay, anything else on the wall? I think the only other thing that I would want to let everybody know that everybody, you know, we just need to be conscious of is um, obviously, I mean, we, we have, you have three notes here in three separate rooms for whatever reason. Uh, they cannot put on the blood writing on this wall, there's no latent prints. There's no fingerprints either, which was something that some people had tried to, to tell us first, that, oh, this is definitely David's fingerprints. Oh, it's definitely David did it. You know, and obviously none of that is true. So the, the fact is nobody knows. The police don't know. Investigators don't know. Anybody who has looked at this case, you cannot tell me that David wrote that there. It is, it is not conclusive that David wrote that. And, and there was no indication that would lead you to think that David wrote that other than pure speculation based on a theory that has nothing to back it up with. That's right. Okay, number 14, David's fingerprints are not on the gun, nor are anyone else's. Okay, well then let's just blame David. Right? Let's just blame him. If if it's nobody else's, who else could it could it be? But see, and that's where he's wrong because there were latent prints they found on that gun, well, on the right. the magazine. But I, right. um, they say that they found a latent palm print on the gun, and the fingerprints, which they believe are two or more on the magazine, um, but still, they cannot um, make those David. They they don't match David's. They don't match David because they don't have a, a palm print. They do have a fingerprint of David, and they could not match the two, item 1A and I believe item 1B. They could not match uh, item 1A-3, the trigger of the gun, and item 1B-1, the magazine of the gun. Neither of those, they can't put the gun in David's hand. They can't put the actual magazine in David's hand. They can't do anything. They can't put the pin in David. The only thing, the only connection, the only print, that matches David is on the notepad found uh, where he wrote submit to Allah, open the rise, the, the latest version, whatever. That's it. That's not much. Yeah. And if he wrote that, it makes obvious sense that his fingerprints and, or DNA would even be on it. But and and again, that, you know, we don't know if it was done under duress. And we don't even know when it was written. Right. I think the, and this is Dan, I think the most important part of the uh, blood writing on the wall is that there's no fingerprints at all, which means a glove or rubber gloves were used to write it, which eliminates David. Why would you do this if you're parting a uh, part to kill, trying to kill your, uh, wife and daughter and yourself, why would you now find a reason to put on a pair of rubber gloves? That That's the question. Uh, yep. No fingerprints were on there, uh, much less David's or anyone else's. And so why was uh, a, potentially a pair of rubber gloves used to, to do the writing? And where did they go? And where did they go? Along with the hands, Three hands and the one arm. Right. Where did right. they go? Yep. Those bones are gone. 
That arm is gone. Who took the arm? Yeah, the majority of their skull gone. Yep. And, oh, the dog yeah. ate him. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't believe it. And the, the one, the important thing I know it's coming up uh, in a bit here, Greg, down the road, but the arm missing. Uh, regardless, my, my stance is regardless if the arm was cut off or the dog chewed it off, the problem with the arm is that it was pulled out of the socket. And the right. socket, uh, Catherine, you can help me out, but there's, there's tendons, ligaments, and muscle that attach that a, a dog uh, cannot do that. So Correct. we know that the dog, especially a mid-sized beagle mix, is not going to pull a arm out of a socket that's in there very tightly with the mus muscular and the tendon and the ligament. So it didn't happen. So regardless if the dog did other things to the arm, it certainly didn't get it out of the socket. The question Correct. is who did it? Even if it was cut off uh, or portions of it cut, that it was removed from the socket. That's the huge point. That's number one on my list to going back to uh, Kenneth Maines. Uh, you can't keep blaming the dog for these things when the arm was pulled out. And then you've got a fractured rib bone that happens to be right beneath the armpit of the little girl, which means le leads me to believe that someone yanked it up and uh, used their foot or their leg or something to uh, to hold pressure to be able to get it out of there. Yeah, a lot of force was applied. A to lot of force. That that, rib, but that to get that to arm out of there. Yep. would have been extraordinary. So that's that's the the point that I'm going back uh, to with with Kenneth Maines with that point. Um, and what, sorry, could, got, what could be I the tried. point? What could be the point of pulling child's arm off her body? Yeah, that's a good question. This makes that's me so angry. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really does. Yeah. And for good reason. And the fact that they don't follow up on it, and the fact that they don't do anything about it, that they just kind of gloss over it, like everything else that we're seeing here. Uh, right. That's it. That's that's a, that's a big problem. It's a big problem. Um, Donna brought up something uh, really good about um, uh, how did they how did they transfer that much blood to the wall? And I wrote that down as my fifth question that hopefully I can send to Dan. Dan's going to get bombarded with a bunch of questions probably, <laughs> uh, and he's going to have to find out which ones are good to really send to Kenneth Maines because this isn't about Kenneth Maines. We're not coming after him or anything. You know, this is just about, we just want to figure out what happened here. We just want to get to the truth. And, and, um, so that's that's what he was hired for. If, if you look at page one or page two, you can kind of yep. see that he was hired for these questions to help us figure out these questions here. Um, so um, how does that much blood get on this wall? Where would this come from? And and I'd love to hear Kenneth Main's view on that. Of, yeah, because okay, there's help, help us out. Yeah, there is no trail of blood from Camille's body to that wall. It had to be a bow. Yeah, there's no trail of blood, nothing. So how did it get now, there? Much, correct. Now, how much would have to be on David's clothing? How oh, much would have to be on that couch? A lot. How much would have to be everywhere else? Unless you pull out that couch, okay? Which there is one indication that I that we found that the couch could have been pulled out because... But then did they have a ladder to get that high up? But Greg, did they have a ladder to get that high up on the wall? You just need yeah. a, a chair. David's David's five eight, five nine maybe. So he's you know he's he he could probably reach that. And I don't know how high that ceiling is. Dan, you've been in in that house. Is that a high ceiling? Could, I could think it's you typical, have uh, typical <laughs> typical ceiling? I think is eight eight seven eight feet high. Eight feet maybe a yeah. standard. And David was I think five eleven maybe. Okay, so uh, even if he had stood on a chair, there would still be blood dripped on that chair. And if he's killing everybody, he wouldn't have cleaned it. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to be standing on something to get up there. But I, I agree with, I think it's, who's online? Is it uh, Pansy? I agree with, with her. It would need to be, the blood would need to be in a bowl, and you'd be standing up there with that bowl, holding it with one hand and writing the words, the letters, yep. with another hand. Um I think some folks were thinking that they were going down 
getting a big handful from the body and then coming back up to the couch and writing a letter, going back down, going to the body of Kamel and getting and doing another letter and then repeat, repeat, repeat to write, you know, two words. Um, and I don't, yeah, because... you don't see the evidence of that going back and forth nope. on that couch. So I think it was drained or, or you know, people say bloodletted, but it was, it was in a, all of it in a bowl, yeah. it seems like to me, that they wrote it all at one time by not going up and down that couch, but going on the couch just once, writing everything, and then being done. Yeah, because it looked like one side of one letter was done with each dipping, I would say. <laughs> yeah, that's really, you're right. And the B, it really shows that to be true, how they wrote the letter B, is multiple strokes. Yes. Yeah. And you can see where they started out. Yeah. Because it's darker. It's darker there and it gets less as they continue that stroke. Yep. So it had it had to have been several it had to have been something that was holding the blood is all I can come up with. Yeah. And quickly too, uh someone wrote in the in the chat just now that because the blood clots so fast and hardens so fast, um, that wouldn't have been something that would have been done. Uh, 20 minutes later, or an hour later, it would have been done within minutes of the body being killed, correct? Yeah, because the blood, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for that blood to start clotting. So it would have to have been done relatively quickly. That's disturbing. Really? Um, yeah. Okay, number 15, um, the knife is on top of stuffing fibers and hair. And he says, I, find, I can find no indication of, of this. Can you please so, tell him to refer him to photo 34 of the 187 from Dan's site? That might help him. Okay, that, that one shows that this knife is on top of yes. some stuffing fibers and, and, and hair. And hair, yes. It's on top of it. So it's like, okay, think about that. That means that all that stuff was on the floor prior to that knife being there. Right. It's, I'm trying to get them to think. It's like, hello, think about this. That would not happen in a murder-suicide, <laughs> you know? Um, You're right there. Yeah, but, right. yes. Anyway, did, yeah, it was, it's photo image 34 of 187. All right, we'll make sure we get that to him. Uh, number 16, stuffing is under blanket by David's leg. Could be dog activity. Really? <laughs> there we go again. So the, the, the dog just decides to put it under <laughs> under the blanket by David's leg. I, I was a little, I don't know. I was very confused. I'm still confused by that, by, by the question, first of all, and by the answer, too. So the stuffing is under the Okay, well that's by. not it's not yeah. necessarily a question. Those are the points that I lay I put I pointed Correct. out as inconsistencies. And having the stuffing under the blanket that is, you know, that's covering David, again, it just goes to show that that, that the stuffing, which they say the dog did after their death, was ripping apart things after their death. Now, how did that get under the blanket? Mm, okay. You know, so w did they leave the dog alone in the house and was stuffing all over when they went and put the bodies down? You know, it's about the only thing that makes sense. I believe that. I see what you're saying here. Um, his, his answer is kind of, you know, it's kind of, well, it could be dog activity. Yeah, it could be. And what it else? could not be. So it's like, yeah. it could be <laughs> human. It, could it be anything else? Does he see any? It seems like this is the only thing he's really thinking about, that it could be dog act, act, activity. Not really thinking, well, it could be dog inactivity as well. But, all right. Anything yeah. else on that one? No. All right, number 17, Prince Ridge detail of bloody footprints never identified, which is true. I don't even know if they really what type of testing, how much testing they actually did on this. But he says, okay, true, I believe that since David and Rania were the only barefoot people in the house, they were able to conclude it was David's footprint. No, that's not a conclusion. They were able to guess. They were able to guess that it was David's footprint. 
which is a good guess, but it's a guess. It's what not was a conclusion. Was there any blood but, on his feet? Nope. <laughs> okay. Now keep reading. If not, you would have to assume that an intruder was barefoot in the home to commit these murders. Not likely or probable. Oh. But here we go, Catherine. It wasn't footprints. <laughs> no, I, they, I, will, yes, I, will go, I will go to my grave saying they're not footprints. <laughs> Catherine, everything, everything here, there is not, all of them say that it is a footprint. Of course, these are all the same people that missed the bullet hole in the ceiling. But they're and these all are all the people that say footprint. David did it. Correct. But, you know, you got toe prints just like you got fingerprints. Yep. And there are no, I mean, again, it's like, oh, when, yeah, you can make that same exact design with your hand. I saw, I saw you do that. Yeah. Very smart. And, I, and then when you measure it out, it, it even measures out when you use your hand, it measures out exactly to match the measurements of those quote-unquote prints on the floor. And I have never seen a toe that it has, you know, a circle and then a line down it. Your toes don't right. make that design. Right. Okay, so Catherine, you were saying there's no blood found on the on David's feet, right? Um, I'm saying no because there was none mentioned it from the autopsy. Correct. And that would have been something they would have noted. I would hope so. Uh uh, that's what I was like. I hope so. <laughs> well, even his toenails were clean, and if he was walking around in blood, right? Exactly. Would, there would be blood under those nails. Mhm. Good how point. Long, how long would? Right on. Right on. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for thanks for jumping in there and bringing some logic to this because I'm I'm having a hard time with this one, but. How long would the, um, let's say he did have blood on his feet. How long would those, would, would the blood last? And as soon as he steps on the carpet, wouldn't the blood from his feet be gone? Not with as, as much as that is supposed to, supposedly on that floor. And, there, right. but, and again, that's the thing. There's nothing leading to that spot. There are no prints leading away from that spot. And it's a good three, four feet away from any carpeted area, if not more. What did he do, jump? I mean, With, how Between the carpet and, the, and where the prints were, I don't think they was that far, was it? If, it doesn't if, look that far. It's at least three feet. You look, it's got to be about three feet. That's more, it's farther than an actual, it's farther than a stride. But yet there's no blood leading up to there, and there's no blood leading away from. There are no, blood, quote, unquote, bloody prints, I mean, leading up to those prints and none leading away from. And it's and only, actually, so, he, I'm he sorry, what can I he would he would have had to turn around too, and that would have showed smeared prints. Yep. If he was standing exactly. on his tippy toes, he would have smeared that blood when he turned around. Yep. So. so those those blood prints they are consistent with where he would have had to have been standing while writing that note on the laptop for whatever reason, even though he had already written a note somewhere else and two, three notes. But is, is that con consistent? It looks pretty consistent. It looks a little off. It looks like the, the, where the right feet were found are actually, actually they don't, I'm looking at them, they don't look that consistent with where that, uh, where the laptop was on the kitchen island. That, what do you guys think about that? I'm trying to get there now. Yeah, let me let me make sure I phrase it right too. It's just where where the prints were found, where the bloody prints were found, because it, they made it seem like well he stepped, you know, he was in blood, his feet were bloody. He stepped here and then he wrote this this note on the laptop on the on the kitchen island. Is that consistent uh, with where he would have had to have been standing? So yeah, that I don't know. I'm trying to find the yeah, photo. Okay. 
Dan, was that you? What? Did you did you just say something? No, it was me. I was just butting in. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So maybe Still, that, we will. That, Go ahead. That print would have been smeared because you had to turn around from there. Right. Point, it wouldn't yeah. have been been as obvious as it was because he had to turn around. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's look at number 18 here. Number 18, no high-velocity blood spatter. Nothing that shows gunshots to heads took place. And he says, I think everything I observed is consistent with gunshot wounds to the head, which I do agree. I just think that the heads were, were not, the heads were, um, you know, very, very low, possibly even, even on, that, on that floor. Gunshot yeah, wounds produce, here's the problem, Greg. Gunshot so, wounds produce a fine mist, or not quite a fine mist, but it produces a mist, and, um, and it's a lot. Um, and what you see on the floor, and, the, and the, the mist type does not produce the blood spatter patterns that are on the floor. What would be other that? Uh, that's a, um, medium velocity with reinforced trauma. A massive beating, a massive beating with yes. some tool. Now he also goes out of his way to to say that he's not a blood spatter expert, and each time we mention high or medium velocity, he doesn't address that. I don't. I don't think, Catherine. Um, I, I don't think he understands the difference between high and medium, and that and that's not necessarily a shot on him. He says he's not a blood spatter expert, but your point is these are different. Certainly they're, the blood has got to be high or medium, and this is certainly medium. Yes. The question is uh, they're not, because they're not high. So if they're not high, there's no gunshot uh, blood uh, results in this, in this living room floor. It's all medium. So who Correct. was who beat beat the hell out of someone, uh, literally in that living room with some tool, instrument, crowbar, hammer, whatever? Um, and there's no find missed. Uh, was anyone even shot in that living room at all? So I don't think he understands the question. It looks, you know, to an elementary uh, a person. That, yes, it looks to me when I first saw the images that yes, people were shot in that home, and that was the result. And, but the reason and, we hired him because of his expertise. Correct. But it doesn't and seem like the, he understands the question. Exactly. And this was the thing that the blood spatter um, expert that I spoke with mentioned. And let's go back to the um, luminol. And when you, uh, I think it was you, Greg, who asked if they should have sprayed the whole living room. And right here in this part is what, what they stated. They said, um, they should, because it is medium velocity blood, they should, said they should have sprayed at the ceiling. They should have sprayed all over to find out where that pattern of blood went. Was there blood on the ceiling? Where, if, and they, since they didn't do this, they don't know. And it's like, you know, um, they could have followed the, the trajectory of where the, the hits were coming from with where the blood would have luminesced once sprayed. And um, because they didn't do that, and they should have, they are going to say, because it's only on the floor, oh, well, yeah, okay, since it, we, don't, we didn't test for blood on the ceiling, we're going to say it's gunshot wound. You know, it, because otherwise blunt force is going to cause blood droplets to scatter throughout the house, like you see on the wall next to the hallway, like you see on the, on the wall next to the door. But they totally ignore all of that throughout the entire, you know, the house. Well, here's the way I see it. I believe that David was sitting with his back up against that chair, and he was beaten there, and that's why all the blood splattered, because there's a lot of blood on that chair. Yeah, there is. Absolutely. And what she, what she means is that uh, that uh, uh, foot position at the bottom of that recliner 
is loaded with blood, soaked in blood, and no one's body is laying um, there. So that's another that's another huge question. Exactly. Okay, anything else on that before we go to number 19? Okay. Not nope. <laughs> Moving on to number 19, David's leg looks looks to be laying on top of fiber stuffing. Why and how? His answer should have been the answer. This is my uh, opinion. His answer to this question should have been the answer to how do the police prove David Crowley guilty? That's what I felt like. This should have been the answer to that because yep. they don't have an answer. Yep. All right, um, number 20, unless anybody else has anything there, go ahead. And, and if anybody, you know, wants to just jump in, please feel free to jump in on this too. Um, number 20, not enough dog feces in the house, roughly 29 separate separate droppings. And he says, I would talk to a veterinarian about about this, but my opinion is it is consistent for a dog that was out of food and began eating the bodies. So there's a lot of food. The dog the dog is out of food if you look at the at the photos and if you look at the reports, they don't mention anything about the two big dog food bags. They don't mention if the dog had a water bowl, which most dogs do. Yeah. So where is where is that photo? Where is the yeah. photo of where the dog's water bowl and where his dry food bowl should have been? But Why the, is that the problem, not included? Yeah, and yeah, see, right. the problem with his, his answer there is is that, you know, if he had looked at the photos, he would have seen that photo with the two large bags of one, one that was unopened and the other one that was opened. And dogs will tear through and scratch open a bag of dog food. My dogs used to do it all the time. You know, and if they're left and they need food and they smell that food, they're going to go for it. And, you know, but yet <laughs> 29 little separate droppings. And, and when I was, you know, um, uh, with Bullet, the dog um, that I had here, you know, I'm counting. The, and this dog is smaller. And that little dog poops a whole lot more than, than poor Paleo did in what they say four weeks worth. And again, just to back you up, okay. my cats will tear into a bag of cat food, even though yeah. they're fed. Yes. They get canned food, they get dry food, or they're free-fed dry food, and they still will tear into a bag of it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why so many of my, even my friends who have dogs, they have to take the dog food bags and put it in a container because the dogs mm -hmm. will go and rip open the bags. Yep. Now, let's say, let's say that the dogs couldn't, for whatever reason, rip, rip open this bag. They would at least try to, which might mean that those two bags that we're seeing, the two big um, uh, bags of dog dry food, that they would at least tip it over or try to get at it. There's right. no indication that they even – there might be a few little rips or something like that, but, I mean, that's a – you know, if, if this is a dog that is able to do all of these other things, you would think he'd be able to tip it over and turn a, turn a bag of dry food onto its side, right? Yep. And he didn't even try to do that. He was a big enough dog. He would have been able to do some damage to that bag if he was starting. Yeah. I mean, All a right, little 11-pound um, cat can do some damage to a bag. <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my cat can do some damage, too. They should never – well, your cat, your cat, um, I think, tore up your um, – your headphones at one point, right? So oh. dropped you off, <laughs> off the call. And headphones. I yeah. have a, yeah. a yeah. special snack for her. There you go. <laughs> okay. 
Number 21, medical examiner did not rehydrate David's left hand for feet to compare other evidence in the house. I got to be honest with you. I did not understand this, this question. So you guys got to explain to me more about this question. Okay. What they do um, um, in cases like this where you have mummified um, digits, I mean not digits, but appendages like the hands and the feet. Now they have a case here where they say that they can't, they, they have latent prints found in the house, but they can't match them to David. Even though they have David's fingerprint card from the military, which should have worked just fine, but for the footprints, um, it is a very easy technique to rehydrate the feet and then to take a cast of that or a print of that and then compare that to the so-called prints on the floor. But not only did they not check the feet for blood, and there's no mention of blood on his feet at all, or in his toenails, like Sophia pointed out, they did state that his toenails were very clean and very well groomed. So there's no blood on his feet at all. And so why did they not rehydrate that foot in that left hand to get prints of David and then compare it to what they found? Why not? I have a question. <clears throat> this is Dan. I have a question. Okay. Go for it. Um, Catherine, you said that was the feet, was David's feet mummified? I know yeah. his hand was. Yes, his feet were mummified as well. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. I was not aware of that. What would cause, what would cause that? Well, because it's easier, the reason why the hands and feet will mummify faster is because there's not as much fat. It's just mainly very thin skin and a little bit of muscle and then the bone. And so okay. since, and it's, so there's not much insulation. So they do tend but, to mummify a lot faster. Okay, but Kamel's or Rania's were mummified. Is that correct or were they also? Um, Kamel's feet were not. Um, I do believe Rania's feet were in a mummified state. Or at least, okay. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah, Kamel's were covered with socks. Correct. Where Rani's and uh, David's were exposed to the air. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Uh, hey, guys, i got to jump off the call, but um, keep up the good work. This is uh, very interesting. i gotta, I got to jump off, though. Thanks for joining okay, us. Okay, Thank you, man. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'll uh, I'll be in touch. I'll be looking forward to to watching this uh, uh, in the next couple of days. Thanks. Okay. You got Bye, Dan. Good night. Good night. Bye, bye. Yeah, and right. I probably should go, go too ahead. because this is the longest I've done anything. <laughs> That's um, okay. So I don't want to overdo it. <laughs> okay. All right. I still have yeah, a few minutes wanna... to go. <laughs> Any any final words for you, Catherine, before you um, ride off to the sunset for now? Um, no, but I, I'm I'm grateful you're forcing me to read this. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other. I know. <laughs> but, but, but you're definitely right. Yeah, you're definitely but, right. Put, yeah, your, put thank, your help first. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pansy. Thank you, Sophia. And, and especially, you guys, I'm glad we did this because actually everyone – has brought out some, you know, again, some points that I know I had not thought about and not and points that I don't believe I've even heard discussed before except for tonight. And I'm really grateful that we've had this conversation. So, um, you know, I look forward to doing this again. And, you know, just thanks, everybody. And, and thank you for your prayers, Sophia and Greg. I, I truly, truly appreciate them. Always. Thank you, Catherine. Well, feel better soon, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks, Pansy. We'll talk to you guys later. Okay, All right. Catherine. Have a good night. Okay, bye. And we just ask everybody to keep Catherine in their in their prayers and just, you know, keep all of us in your in your prayers because we we definitely need it and um we're just gonna yeah. keep marching forward here as much as we can. Um as we move on here, uh I believe we covered there we go, number twenty three. Uh number twenty three. When police left the scene, they had six casings, one unspent cartridge, and four fragments. Without having knowledge of those of whose blood, tissue, brain matter was on the evidence, it was determined to be a murder-suicide. 
Once tested, the evidence retrieved that night showed the blood belonged to Kamel. The police chief called it a murder-suicide without the bullet that killed David being found. And his answer is, uh, that's, a, that's a long question, by the way, but his answer, or it's a long uh, statement, let's say. It's called a statement. He says, I do not know why he did this, maybe because all indications it looked like that to him does not mean it was a conspiracy or a cover-up. This is kind of the second time here. Um, there might be more, but at least two, three times where he's talking about a conspiracy or a cover-up. We're not asking him to look at, you know, to, to say, well, this, you know, to help us solve that this is a conspiracy or a cover-up. And so, Fia, I think you brought up a great point where you mentioned um, – this is this is this might be another thing, and maybe so so Sophia, you can comment more on this, where it kind of seems like he watched the the documentary, and he's kind of going in that that thinking, oh, this is where these guys are coming from, because obviously if somebody is hired, they're going to be like, okay, what am I hired? What am I hired for? Who am I hired by? And it's like if he thinks that you know we're just conspiracy theorists or people that are looking for a for a cover up. A lot of his questions, a lot of the answers, a lot of his answers to these questions seem like he is defensive. Is anybody else mm-hmm. seeing that? I can't be the only one who's seeing that. Yeah, I think so too. If I was hired to investigate something, I'm going to check out who I was hired by. Good food for thought. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and this, yeah, this just, I mean, that, that answer to me is just like, it, it's like, it's almost like just keep it to the first sentence. That second sentence doesn't even need to be added in there. But, um, let's go 24. Okay. Now we're getting into Chris Klein. Chris Klein was the one who reported the hole in the ceiling. Agreed. Okay. Well, there we go. That's it. <laughs> I love how his answers are non-answers. Okay. Okay, and uh, you got seven thousand dollars for this easy money. Let's go in here. Uh, Number twenty-five. Chris Klein lied to the police about being in the house with Dan Senior, and he lied about having permission to be in the house. And his answer is, I would want to look into why he lied. Of course, if true. All right, that's going to be my sixth thing. So. Um, Could you also look into why everybody else is lied in regards to this case? Why not? Not trying to be snippy, it's just, it's the truth. When well, I mean, you look at all the records, and you look at what they've stated, a lot of people are lying. Wasn't that his job to look into this, or to look into this question here, or, or no? Like, it's like, well... Yeah. Who? This is this is why we're asking you this question because we want you to look into this and find out something. But in instead of him just saying, "Yeah, somebody lied here," that's definitely true. There's something weird. You know, there's something wrong there. The police should have followed up. You know what? The police didn't do a great job, but they should have followed up on it. But it's it's like it's a very defensive answer, right? My take on his answers is that he did not want to offend any law enforcement. And I guess right. if you're a PI, you would not want to offend the police because you need those uh, departments in the future. If you ever need to have any FOIA requests filled or you have any questions in regards to a case, you want to be able to go to a detective and not burn those bridges. But... He could have looked more into these answers or questions, excuse me. And he didn't. He was trying to, I guess, keep his reputation. That's what it sounds like. Thank you. I still think about that hole, hole in the ceiling. Mm-hmm. I, that that really uh, messes with my mind because I don't think it was there when the police went in there. 
Why do you think Unless, that? Because I think Chris Klein and him went in there and did something maybe to prove a point or something. How much did yeah. they know what the police found? How much did they know about what the police found? Only what the news report said. I still, to this day, stand by my first feelings where it was staged to look like a hate crime. The police ruled it a murder-suicide, so the ones who staged it to look like a hate crime went back to make it look like a murder-suicide. Uh-huh. And then, yeah. oh, I actually see a bullet hole from the very first day. I'm going to hold to that theory. Right, right. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's one thing that uh, I think a lot about because I don't believe it was there when the police came the first time. I really don't. See, I kind of lean towards it only because two – Two things, two reasons that I lean towards it is because I have not seen a photo that conclusively shows me that there was or that there wasn't. Right. And, and, and they have that photo. They claim to have that photo. So that even tips me more towards their side to say, well, not only, you know, do they say, you know, they say that they missed it on that day, which is good. That, that's what they should say. But they also say that they have that photo. The only thing missing right now, the, the, the last step that I would like to see to close this door is to say, if you have that photo, please give it to us. Give it right. to the public so, so we can see it. That's all we're asking. I don't think that's too much to ask for. Really? I mean, it's a picture of the hole in the ceiling. It's not a picture of the bodies in the living room. So why are they holding on to dear life with, for this photo? We've requested it several times. I think they're they're covering their tracks. I don't think it exists. Prove me wrong. <laughs> it's only one way. Right. Only one way to find out with, with the Maury Povic show. You know, just show us the facts. Um, Twenty six. Chris Klein enters the attic before police arrive. He said, "This has no relevance to the crime, in my opinion." Really. It is okay. when the bullet is found on top of the stuffing that's in the attic. What do they call that? Insulation. Uh, the insulation. It's found on top of it, laying on top. That's what so, it's mm-hmm. It's not embedded in wood. It's not in the ceiling or the rooftop. It's sitting right on top. And them going up into the attic is is fishy, too. Yes, absolutely. And on top of that, they had no business in the house. Well, I mean, apparently to Kenneth Maines, it has no 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 relevance to the to the crime. Right. Does it have relevance to the crime scene? At least, I mean, does it have relevance to the crime scene? You know, you have to remember this: if he was there before. Before the bullet was actually found, then we have three crime scenes, right? So we have the crime right. scene on December, on uh, January 17th, on January 19th, and then the crime scene on February 18th. So, right. So anyway, so uh, the question number seven that I'm going to write down here is to ask him to please tell us more about your answer to the question of number 26. Well, I have a question. If the house was released and they didn't find that bullet until a month later, would that bullet be evidence in a trial if there was ever one? I mean, could they prove that it was there at the time that the murders happened? I guess is what I'm trying to say. And they would they would be forced to they they would they would have to prove it, um, and I think the problem is right now they're not really forced to, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. 
Because didn't they receive a, or they issued a search warrant to go back into the house that day, didn't they? Correct. Okay. I'm just wondering if it's, I don't know, it's all hypothetical at this point. It's a quagmire. All right, number 27, item 57 was not or could not be tied to David's gun. And he says, not true. Lab reports state that item 57, the bullet from the attic, was fired by item 1. He does not go into the details, and he needs to be forced to go into the details of how they prove that item I'm 1 going back to the fired item 57. Right now. Yeah, there is, there is no proof because they, what they use, and this guy would know this, that it's, it is a, I mean, come on. They're using a fragment. They're comparing a bullet fragment, which is item 31, to item 57. They say based on that, that that proves that item 1 fired item 57. That is, that is, to me, I have a lot of problems with that, a lot of problems with that one. I have the report right here, and I was trying to read the exact wording that they used. Okay. And do you remember what page number that was on at all? Okay. Yeah, it's um, the ballistic or the science. It's one of the last. It's it's in the firearms, so I think it's actually. The last page. I'm trying to see where the firearms report is. The firearms okay. report should be like one of the last pages there. Um, it is page thirty-one. Thirty-one. Okay. And let's see. Item 57 against item 31 show the presence of matching features. And then it says this means item 1 fired 31. It never says anything about item 57 being fired from item 1. Item 57 right, so against mm -hmm. item 31 showed the presence of matching features. This means item 1 fired item 31. So if he would have read page 31, he would see that there's no connection between item 1 and item 57, correct? Correct. Uh-huh. And if it was fired from a similar gun, they could have matching features. Could. Quotation marks. I mean, reading reading that, it sounds like they're not even sure that item 57 fired, yeah, was fired from item 1. So how could he be sure? Can't be. Like, like they knew if they found a bullet up in the attic, it belonged to the gun he had, so they just let it go at that. Pretty much. Okay, number 28. Um, <laughs> this is crazy. Item 57 was found one month later after the scene was released and cleaned by a professional cleaning crew. He says, this is not an uncommon occurrence. It doesn't show malice or misdirection by police, in my opinion. Once again, trying to stay in favor with police departments. And it is his job to work with them, so... <sighs> That's part of his training. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd wonder if his training would allow him to look up at the ceiling, too. And we know um, they number, can. We know, we they, know can, that they can look up. But are they trained to? And if they're not trained to, you know what? Maybe we should maybe we should help them with that. Maybe we should help them see, you know what, you guys? When you enter a room, just look up. 
Make sure there's well, nothing Greg, up there. The other case that I got from Apple Valley, one of the very first things that they talk about is looking up and seeing the bullet hole up there by the stairs. And this was for the other case. Same police officers. So they can look up. Maybe they, they learned from it. Maybe they learned from not looking up in the Crowley case. They were able to learn for the for the next case, which is great, which is what they should do. But let's let's keep that on a consistent basis for every case, for everybody. Because we're not just talking about the police that didn't look up. We're talking about everybody who came into that house. Mm-hmm. Everyone. There is not one person that came into that house on January 17th or January 18th or January 19th. Not the cleaning crew. The only one who saw it was Chris Klein. Nobody else saw just, it. So that's the so maybe Klein should, 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 should yeah. So maybe Klein should be doing some training for them. I just don't believe it was even there. I don't either. Very suspicious. All right, so um, let's see. We did not see. Okay, it's obviously not see the bullet hole. Looking at number twenty-nine, that has been determined as speculation and assumption that they would have noticed it. Really? Okay, really. So, I mean, that that kind of goes back to their to their training, where they're saying that they're not trained to really look up and notice if there's a bullet hole up there, right? It would have to match the trajectory or something like that, but, but okay. Did they even do that? I think that they did it for 57 and the one in the, the basement, but I don't think that... They stuck their finger in the hole, I know. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Stick their finger in the home. Yeah, why not? Just see what's in there. Okay, number and 30. Did they, the test blue... that for... did they test it for gunpowder? I can't remember. Or stippling? That hole? I don't know if they tested anything about that hole. Yeah, I don't think so. There's, uh, we don't have anything on that. Okay. Um, we have Donna in the chat asking, um, how did Klein know that the bullet hole was not there before? I think that's a great question, and we can't say, and I just want to clarify for you, Donna, that we can't say that um, Klein didn't know. Um, I think Mason Hendricks is is the one who, you know, was like, well, didn't the police see this this hole? Which is what he told me, which, again, consider the source. With mm-hmm. with Klein, it would be good to um, get a transcript of the conversation between Chris Klein and the investigator who was talking to him to really see, because the way that that report is written, it seems like Klein starts talking about this hole Maybe he didn't know that the police didn't didn't know uh, about this hole. But Klein is like telling them things. He's he knows a lot. How could they know? They weren't there when they did all that. It just seems really interesting at how much information they claim to that, know, right? <laughs> and how quickly they claimed to have known it, right? Did they have somebody on the inside giving them the information? Good be. Never know. It's a question. It's just yeah. a question. I'm not accusing people. No. Just another question. question. But what, Pansy? But what were they doing in the house two days later? When the house hadn't even been released yet. It hadn't even been cleaned. Right. So what were they doing there? That's a million dollar question.
It's just not normal behavior. They were anxious about something. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number 30, the blue blanket was under Kamel yet over David. And his answer that- or his comment on that is possible animal activity. I said the dog did it. Paleo it was I, busy I, I, in those I, days. I can't see how the dog could have done that good a job, really. Uh, let's see. 31, the knife blade was locked in locked open position. I do not understand the relevance of this. Okay. Okay. The knife has no In the living room, between three bodies, and it's open, but it has no relevance. He's got the same answer for number 32. The knife blade was pointing towards David's upper body. I don't understand the relevance of this. This looks like, this is a template. And one one of the first things, that I, you know, notice, maybe other people notice it too, is a lot of this, it just looks like templated answers, not specifically for these uh, 48 questions, but some of the other stuff just looks like, it It makes me want to see Maine's investigative services reports for other cases, for other people that have hired him. I want to see if we see the exact same templates that we're seeing here. Or is this him really typing this up and it's all natural? Um, I want to see if anything is a template because there shouldn't be any templates here. All right, number 33, decomposition does not equate to three weeks. Dr. Lewis, now, he, agree, he, he that agrees with that. He does agree with that. No, he disagrees yes. with that from what it sounds like. Okay. Uh, say I don't Dr. know. I don't know. I'm conflicted over that one. On number 33? Why? About the bodies and the time of death. I'm still very conflicted over that. Yeah, I, thought he I, am, I am too. I am too. I thought he agreed so, with how much time that uh, correct. we all came to. Like two weeks, no more than 10 days, I mean. No, I think from reading number 33, the way that I interpret it is that he agrees that the bodies were there for three weeks, which is what I tend to, I tend to agree with that too. Could be, but. But that's why decomp is so important and understanding decomp rate and all of that is is very important to this to this case so right um, right that should give us a very clear timeline of what is the maximum that it could like how did they come to this three-week theory was it just based on because nobody had seen the Crowleys from December 26th or December 25th December 24th so it must be three weeks Or did they actually do some documentation? Did they do some work to show based on decomp, based on this, based on that, yes, these bodies were there for three weeks. No no doubt. They have no doubt in their mind because I think that's what's caused a lot of these questions where we're like going back and forth like, okay, we have some people who understand decomp saying, wait a minute, it can't be three weeks, the bodies wouldn't look like this for three weeks. The body, this wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen. So you have other people saying, yeah, it's, you know, I just think it's right. It's seven, eight, three weeks, and that's it. I hmm. just wish that the autopsies were consistent on how they were written because Kamala was not in detail, David is not, and I would love Supposed to be more consistent. That would that would give me more of an idea. His is almost vague when it talks about the decomp and I mean the God has had time, or at least he did, for mummification of the feet and of the hand or hand. 
and there's really not an explanation except for the fact that they were just exposed to the air. I, I, think said, I think Catherine said one time about them being bound. Might cause the mummification. Now, I don't know, but that, I believe Catherine came up with that a while back. I'm not familiar with that theory. I mean, I, I've heard her say it before. But I, I can't agree or disagree with it. I I haven't read anything on it. Yeah, I'm still I'm still open to it. I mean, obviously we we don't, we want to be open to it, but yeah, we're just looking in, into that. Uh, number thirty four. David was thin and de- Paleo was thin and dehydrated. He did not present. He was not. He did not present as an animal that had been feasting on dead human flesh. And his answer is, I disagree. The dog wasn't feasting. It was forced to after running out of food. And we know that's not true because there was a bag and a half of dog food right there in his room. Yeah, and Kenneth Maines was giving was given the these crime scene photos, whether he saw the um, the dog food in these photos or not. or And the other thing is, why didn't he question where is the dog's bowl? Where is the dog's water bowl? Where is the food bowl? What what source did, did the dog have for water for, you know, food? That was a problem. It's a really good um, number. I mean, it's a really good question. Where, where is it? Why was it taken up? David's a good shot. If he had meant to kill Paleo, he would have. I know yeah, it's morbid to think about. It is. Well, I mean, it's morbid to think about killing your pet. But he didn't. So was he going to starve them? I mean, and that that dog was a member of the family. So why wouldn't he have taken the dog out too? Well, there was another murder suicide that I investigated where the two family cats were left alive too. But at least they had food and water. Well, we don't know how much uh, Paleo had either at this time of their death. You know, they could have had a bowl of water and a bowl of food sitting in there. We just don't see photos of it. Nope. Don't have that to go by. Nope, not at all. Um, Number 35, no pools of blood located anywhere in the house. Where did the blood to right on the wall come from? He says blood probably came from the head wound of Kamel. So this is where he's saying that uh, the blood that was used to write on the living room wall, Allah Akbar, came from, probably came from Kamel's head. What do you guys think about that? I can't disagree with it. I just would like to know how did he collect it and what did he supposedly use? Because we don't see that at the crime scene. He does a partial cleanup. You know, after all this planning and staging, I, I don't know. It don't all sit right with me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, but why why doesn't it set right with with you? What do you just Okay, so he is supposed to be this perfectionist, but he leaves two supposed bloody footprints and cleans everything else up. He gets rid of the buckets of 
whatever he used for, to collect the blood. He got rid of the supposed uh, gloves, but leaves trash in the house and all the garbage cans. He got rid of the towels that supposedly wiped up the blood. That was all the bloody footprints of him walking around the house. Probably Paleo's bloody footprints, too. That leaves just two of them. And the arm and the hands. Yeah. I mean, it's overstaging. Yeah, really. Like I said, it's an overkill. Yeah, that it is wasn't sure. just, It just wasn't a suicide pact. I mean, if you're going to shoot somebody, shoot them in the head and be done with it. Don't do all this other stuff. And with the hollow point, you're making a really big statement with that one, even with just one shot to the head. And you got three bullets with Kamel's DNA at least two shots to the head. That's some extreme anger right there. Right. Now, it's very possible don't... that first bullet went through one of our hands or both our hands. She could have held it up to block her face since so she's missing it. But we, we honestly don't know. No, do we Do we know... For certain, because I know there was another member of our of the group that uh, brought up. Um, do we know it if it was a hollow point? Are we? Yes, they were hollow sure points. That? They were hollow points. Yeah, it showed it showed all of them in the box was hollow points. Right, but the ones taken and out the, of the cartridge, and the, the ones one, taken out of the, the one, okay. the one that was on the table was a hollow point. It was a hollow point too? Okay. Yeah. I think that was a very important thing. Um, Number 35, no pools of blood located anywhere in the house. Where did the blood on the writing come from? Blood probably came from Kamel. Number 36, item 57, does not have any blood, tissue, hair on it or on the fragment. And I think that's kind of where he's like, oh, that's not true. You know, he he jumped on that. Nothing could be determined even after spraying the item or swabbing the item. He's like, not true. DNA was recovered from this bullet and matched David. He didn't, so, tissue, yeah, and he didn't tissue, read. Right? He didn't read that they tested it for blood and it came out negative for blood. Right. If it's going right. through that skull, it's going through skin, it's going through muscle, I mean, it it would have been on that bullet. All right, right. But the way that he's go ahead. But it's but it's the way that he's answering it because the the door was left open. Well, it could have been blood, tissue, or or hair from the DNA. He could have just saw that as well. No, there's there's DNA tissue, right? Yeah, but it was touch DNA, not blood DNA. Not blood, but it could have been tissue. No? If you look at that bullet, it's a lot cleaner than the other bullet found on the other one floor. It is yeah. extremely clean. Sure is. All right, number 37, Dan Jr. said that he dropped off the packages on December 28, 2014, yet the neighbors do not recall seeing the packages until January 10th. He said they had no reason to pay attention to the Crowley home. This does not mean they were not there. Um, the problem with that is that Colin Procknell had plowed the um, the driveway on... Um, actually, no, I think he did that on December... Before Christmas, so okay, so that is accurate because he wouldn't have seen the presents because they wouldn't have been there before then. So, okay, so I, I can see where this guy's coming from. I don't have any problem with number thirty-seven. Do you guys? Yeah, and I go back and forth on that one. I mean, it's very possible they could have been out there that long. I. 
if you hadn't changed his story, I wouldn't have a little doubt. All right, number 38, pot on the dresser looks staged. Should not be in the grinder, and there are no smoking papers. He says, not true. I've worked undercover narcotics for over a decade. Didn't look staged. You don't need smoking papers. There was a bong in the bathroom, which is which is right. I think really what number 38 should have been is that this looks like a scene that was interrupted. Because if this guy has mm-hmm. seen these things, if he's seen this stuff, then he should be able to understand when, hey, somebody was just doing this stuff and there was a knock at the door, we we kicked down their, their door, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, I think he should have been able to kind of tell that. So I think the phrasing of the question or the phrasing of the statement on number 38 um, could have been why he answered this way. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think the phrasing might have confused him. All right. Uh, 39, according to those who use marijuana, the tweezers on the dresser next to the pot are wrong. Uh, I disagree. (laughs) Okay. That don't make any difference. You can use any kind of tweezer. I'm experienced, I know. (laughs) <laughs> my, my, my husband used to do that all the time so you know I was I, I went through that for years no any any kind of tweezer works but if there were tweezers on the dresser does that show that you know they were using they were smoking a, a joint as opposed to um, smoking in a in a bong. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understand the relevance of the tweezers. To be honest, if you leave seeds and marijuana, they tend to want to pop. So you pick the seeds up to keep it from popping, maybe out on the floor while it's hot, burning things. You always pick the seeds out. That's what the tweezers are for. You know, for pothead. Nice. I never knew that. You know. Okay, that makes sense. With having bongs in the house and clean, the the pipe cleaners and everything, you would think that pot would show up in their system. Right, it would have. But it didn't. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> to me, that just looks like more staging. Definitely. All right, number 40, know, kitchen. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, number 40, kitchen window was unlocked. He said, this may be true, but I have no knowledge of it. Well, if, you know, we're going to give you the documents that are going to show you knowledge of it. And based on that, um, I mean, okay, <laughs> let's say it was true. Doesn't that show one more sign of, you know, um, there was that there was no need for anybody to break in. There was no need to look for signs of struggle. This was the second way that somebody could have entered the house. However unlikely, because I don't believe anybody's going to enter through that kitchen window. I think the kitchen window was actually unlocked because um, maybe they were trying to air out the house from cooking or something like that. Maybe it was just whatever. Right. I don't think there's any relevance to it, but he just almost just it's like, well, he doesn't he doesn't know that. You know, it's like, well, why don't you say, well, I don't know that, but I don't see the relevance of it. That I could understand, but. And I can understand airing out the kitchen, too, especially if you're frying something or. Seems logical. Okay, number 41. Snow was trampled down around the house and on the back deck prior to police arrival. How do we know this? He says, I did not see this documented anywhere. Snow was trampled down. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that, too. I'm not sure where the snow was trampled down. But that's that's a quote, so it's got to be in the report somewhere. I mean, there's photos of it in the back, the backyard where there's like footprints 
But didn't they report that they had to chase paleo around the backyard? Or am I just repeating what somebody said? Well, yeah, no, what they did is they they walked around the whole backyard. You have um, a couple neighbors who were walking around the yard, the backyard, all that stuff, too. And then, then you have um, uh, where they take photos of what they've done, and they, and they note that there are other tracks, and there are actual, I think there are actually animal tracks, too. So there are other other tracks out there, um, but I just think maybe maybe Kenneth Maines was kind of thrown off by the trampled down. He's probably not sure what what exactly that means. Maybe I don't know. Just guessing there. Yeah, I don't understand the meaning of it either. All right, number forty-two. The bodies were moved by the police, which I don't believe is true, to be honest with you. But this is what number forty-two is. The bodies were moved by the police and then written in the reports as being in the position found. And he asked the same question that I would ask: How do we know this? I saw no indication of this being done. Now I know um, Dan and and Catherine probably have a lot more on this, so we'll kind of keep that open if they want to respond to this but for for me you know i mean there's the rania like if 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 i were to say if any bodies were moved i would believe hers would be moved before david or camille's but what do you guys think about the bodies being moved just in general yeah i would agree that any bodies are not moved uh whether it was the dog or i don't think anybody would have their firearm. But it, it, her body does look moved. Like she had been laying on her side, maybe with the, the fluid that's there on her pant leg. All right, we're almost there. We're almost done here. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in here. Uh, number 43, David's left finger position is not in a natural death position. This is, a, this is a big one. And he says, I disagree. I never heard of a natural death position. He needs to see how the left finger was and tell us, how is that natural? Why do you think that that is a natural way for a hand to be because you've never seen a natural death position? What death positions have you seen that aren't natural? I mean, I, to me, it's just, that was a weird answer. What do you guys say? I just thought it was a non-answer again. <laughs> a non-answer. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually your, your thumb <laughs> and your finger are not just going to naturally, hey, we're just going to be like this. I don't know. They're going to be relaxed. Going to be relaxed. Or, or they're going to be more like a claw. I could see it like a claw. But right. if you only have if, two fingers that are like a claw and not all five fingers, I think I think we've got a problem there. Yeah. Okay, number 44, the latent prints found. They were matched to the police officers on scene. I do not have an answer for this. Uh, oh, the, okay. The latent prints found, were they matched to the police officers on scene? Yeah, he said, I do not have an answer for this. I, I don't either, and I don't, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not really sure why that one was even included. Um Number 45, the police did not look at anyone to be a suspect despite the proof of a large amount of money being at stake. And Sean Wright's threat to David saying he was upset with David because he felt he would be thrown in prison. And the answer is, I think the police did their due diligence in interviewing potential suspects. Uh, I mean, that's like a, that's like we put him on the witness stand. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> really? He's yeah, it was like, eh, I'm going to keep that one short and simple so I don't get myself in trouble, which makes me think, you know, why would you do that? Just tell us whatever you think, right? Um, number 46, Camille's left hand was originally under her body, so 
so that meant Paleo could not have eaten her left hand. It was missing prior to her body being placed. And he says, I disagree. All right. That's it. I still can't get over disagree. $7,000 was spent for him just to write, I disagree. No explanation. I mean, what does he disagree with? I mean, he was so, he was, he, he had, it is an honor, yeah, because he, he wrote so much on the fruit and talking about the fruit and all that, and then when, he, when we get to some real things, you know, some real stuff we're trying to talk about, I disagree. That's it. All right. That could probably sum up his whole this whole thing here. Number 47. Police reports say no ammo in the house, and which I don't know where that came from because there was ammo. There was ammo um, in the, I believe there was ammo found. I know there was ammo found in the um, car, which I guess mm -hmm. is in the garage, technically is not in the house, but it's still on the property. Um, and thinking about that, I was like, wait a minute. So that's hard to to think that there was no ammo and all found in the house. So I want to know where that quote came from. I want to learn more about number 47. Cause, yeah. How is he going to have a gun to protect himself but no ammo? I mean, I can understand it being loaded and maybe extra clips loaded, but he's going to keep the ammo in the car? I mean, there should have been ammo in the basement. There should have been ammo in that closet, in that green locker that was in the master bedroom closet, right? Should have been there. Yeah, we need to find out more about this question because to me that's, it doesn't sound right. It's true. There should have been some ammo in that gun safe. Yeah. Should have been something. Well, he did have a loaded well. clip. But he had a loaded he had a loaded magazine, not a clip, sorry. Mm -hmm. Loaded mag. So he was ready, you know, I mean got got a loaded mag in the gun, he got a loaded mag in the gun safe. Yeah. There wasn't a okay. there wasn't that. a box of ammo in there? There should have been. I, I mean, think there, there was been. and it showed how many shells was. was missing out of it. Correct. Correct. Now, where did, where did that one come from? Did that come from inside of the house, or did that come from inside of the, uh, of the trunk of the car, I think is the question. I thought it came out of that gun box. Yeah. And that gun box was part of, uh, was part of multiple gun boxes in the uh, car trunk, which is another sign that they were getting out of Dodge. That they were leaving. That they were not planning on staying there for whatever reason they wanted to get out. Um, that car, that car was loaded down with a lot. It really was, and that's why it's important to know which car was being sold, which which car um, were they planning on keeping and possibly taking out to Cali because they were they were headed out here. They were headed to Southern Cali. I don't care what anybody says. Right? I think that's clear. There was mm -hmm. no way that David was, was going to make this movie, make this project without being local. He was going to need to be out in, in, in California, in Southern California, where he could go and go to these daily meetings and meet That's with right. all these people and all that stuff. You can't do that if you're in Minnesota. You have to be in California. Everybody right. in Hollywood will tell you that. Okay, we find out which car was loaded in the in the in the turtle because that's where all the gun cases were. Another thing to note is that David did have some calls uh, to a realtor in California in Ocean's View or Oceanside, California. That's right. That's right. And he had a mortgage company that was running his credit a couple of times. Yeah, and can okay. you can you um 
can you find us more or can you give us maybe in the future, you know, in the next day or day or two, can you, you know, give us like more in information on that, something that people can find? Because that's been one of those other things that have just been like, there's so much data to go through that a lot of these things get kind of lost or they, they slip through the cracks. And that is a big one that I think has been brought up over and over again. And I just want to make sure keeps getting brought up to the new people, you know, to people that are just looking in into this stuff, uh, looking into the the Southern California angle, because there is something there. I, I do believe there is a big thing there. This, You know, there is a lot there. That's what I think. Well, I do know that uh, you will see on his credit report on the very last page that the mortgage company ran – his credit two different times. I believe one was in either November, late November or early December, and then again in January. And then Mm -hmm. uh, the calls were made, I believe, either November or early December, and those should be on one of the spreadsheets from David's phone numbers, which are all loaded to your, uh, your blog. And they'd find out which car was loaded up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. I'll have and to that can be found, look at the photos. That's in the crime scene. Yeah, that's it. Uh, right. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, all right, just wrapping up here. Um, my throat is really hurting here. I want to. We only have two more to go through, so I want to make sure we get through these. Uh, number 48. Below is an image of the detective notes. This shows that Leighton Prince, uh, palm print LP1A-1, found on the magazine that the handgun had a visible scar. This info was not translated on the typed police reports. It is reported that David Crowley did not have a scar on either of his palms. So I think this, I know this one comes directly from Catherine, right, where she's talking about um, that there is a visible scar and mm-hmm. on this palm print. Um, now, they also don't have a palm print of David Crowley. So they don't have a palm print to compare to this, right? Right, right. And now, this is, now, uh, if we exclude the whole fruit thing, um, this is probably the longest answer that he gives. This, in my opinion, is not from the detective notes, but rather from the lab technician. That is correct. This is from the BCA yeah. lab. Probably mm-hmm. Jennifer. Okay. LP1. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Um, LP1A-1 is not a latent palm print from the magazine. It is a latent palm print found on the pistol recovered from the scene, which, which fired six rounds. I would want to first talk to, and, and it's like, I thought this is what we hired you for. I would want to first talk to whomever made this note about the print. It is possible they are referring to something else, and I would not want to uh, assume. And um, I, I do believe that that was like an extra, there was an extra cost if Dan wanted to hire him to actually talk to people. So mm-hmm. um, he says, if we take this note as factual, and the word scar as literal, there needs to be some investigative work done. Since there are yeah. no palm prints taken of David, they were unable to compare the latent and to observe a possible scar of the palm, which is true. I mean, we, we know that. In order to eliminate David as a source of this scar, I would track down his military prints to determine if this was his, or at the very least, if he had a scar. If you are unable to track down these prints, which we are not, we know that these prints have been tracked down, and I I don't believe there, I don't believe that the, that the army, the military has a uh, palm print of him, none that they've given to the authorities. Um, He says, I would want to interview all the people who knew him and question them specifically about him having a scar on his palm. This is a great question, and this is a great way for us to end this right right here. Um, 
with this scar. And then I think maybe we'll come back next time and maybe talk a little more about the con- conclusions and all that drama. But um, any last words on this scar? Do you think David had a scar? Have you seen a scar? Why would there be a scar? And does this show that uh, uh, the palm print found on the gun does not match David? From all the photos that we have of David, we do not see a scar on that palm. There's no mention from family members either about having a scar. There you go. So if there's anybody out there, any family, any friends, anybody who served with him, anybody who knows the scar on David's palm, please let us let us know because otherwise I think this kind of conclusively shows that uh David um that you can't <laughs> that there there is a palm print that the palm print that is matched to the gun does not match David, right? I mean I think that's what Catherine found. That's what. Well, I would like to we, add that we would yeah. and we would appreciate photo evidence instead of word from your mouth because people tied to this case have been known to say anything to prove David guilty. I'd like to see photo evidence to prove he had a scar. Right, and that's the only way that that you can prove it is if you have facts, and if you don't, then you can't prove anything. Uh, mm-hmm. Any any final words here? No, my mind is going round in circles as it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, well, okay. as I always end every video, I just like to encourage everybody to please read the the reports and look at the crime scene photos. And if you find anything new, please let us know because. It's very possible we could have overlooked something, and all the eyes that we can get on these reports is is a good thing. We really could use everybody's help. Sure can. Amen. Amen to that. Pansy, any final words? No. I'm ready for bed. <laughs> all right. <laughs> there we go. I'm two hours right. later than y'all are. <laughs> <laughs> Love All right, y'all. Good peace. Okay. Enjoy. Enjoy. Have a great night. Y'all Greg, right. feel Thank better. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I'm, I'm about tapped out here. My throat is done for the evening. Thanks, to everybody, for, stick, for, for sticking with us. And um, Thank y'all. hope to do another conference call again soon. Yeah, thank y'all. Have a good night, good night. everybody. All good right. Good night. Too. Bye now. Bye. Bye.